歴史的な開国から数十年文明開化の大号令のもと極東の島国にまさに今西洋文化の大波が押し寄せていた活気に満ち溢れる帝都の民は変化革新の熱気にむせ返りその変化に戸惑う者も飲み込んで時代は大きなうねりの中にあった。The year was 2013. The new crossover game Professor Layton vs. Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney, had hit store shelves, and it was time for Shu Takumi and Shintaro Kojima to look to the future of the Ace Attorney series. After a few months, Takumi had decided that the next Ace Attorney game should focus on civil trials, similar to the final case of Ace Attorney 6. But I realized the game would be about rather ugly topics, like mediation between family members fighting over an inheritance, or settling things out of court in a case of being falsely accused of molesting. Cases with no clear cut conclusions. However, it was at that point that Takumi remembered one of his initial ideas from the inception of the original Ace Attorney trilogy a game in which a certain detective makes wrong assumptions, leading the player to have to fix them in order to find the truth. After some consideration, Takumi decided to make this idea a reality with Sherlock Holmes and Naruhodo Ryonosuke, the ancestor of Phoenix Wright. What would then ensue is the creation of a beautiful tale of friendship, treachery, and resolve. Known exclusively to Japan as Dai Gyakuten Saiban, or the Great Ace Attorney. Hi everyone, I'm Lumiere, and I'll be taking you down the rabbit hole known as Dai Gyakuten Saiban, or DGS. I'll be talking extensively about the development and localization, or lack thereof, of DGS, as well as give you a general review of the game itself, with a spoiler list and spoiler section. So strap yourself in, because you're in for one hell of a ride. Although I should clarify that the non spoiler section is just a brief review of the first case, as well as gameplay, music, etc. So if you're sensitive to those kinds of spoilers, then, well, nah, I don't know what to tell you. But before I start talking about anything, I want you to know that this game has a full fan translation by Scarlet Study for both 3DS and Android, so please go to the description, download the translation, buy a copy of the game, and support the devs. Also, subscribe to the channel because more than 50% of you are unsubscribed, and subscribing would really help me create more videos such as this. Thank you. Now, Let's say you don't know what Ace Attorney is. Ace Attorney is a series of visual novel games in which you take the place of a defense attorney known as Ryuichi Naruhodo, or Phoenix Wright here in the States, to investigate crime scenes and defend your client in court by interrogating witnesses, collecting evidence, and pointing out lies to get closer to the truth of the case. This formula has been repeated many times over the course of five games and three spin offs before the idea of Dai Gyakuten Saiban was first established. Naturally, the franchise was starting to feel rather worn, especially with the reception of Apollo Justice, Dual Destinies, and Leighton vs. Wright. The higher ups at Capcom told Takumi they wanted an accessible game that would restart the franchise in a new direction, leading Takumi to look at different avenues for the series to go. The idea for Civil Trials came first, but again, it wouldn't lead to satisfying conclusions. While this idea would come back in Spirit of Justice for the final case, it wouldn't have worked to do the same formula over the entire game. Hell, the civil trial in Spirit of Justice only worked because it was half of the full case. It was only then that Takumi looked back to an idea he had ever since the year 2000 joint reasoning. The initial idea was vague and undefined, but it was enough to be made into a demo and barely enough for the higher ups to get on board. Since this was his first time having full control over an ace tourney game since Apollo Justice, Takumi began to feel rather competitive with his past self. It's been a while since I wrote an Ace Attorney scenario, so there was the pressure to write something that, in terms of quality, wouldn't lose from Ace Attorney 1 to 3. So, with that pressure, I just started writing without thinking about pacing or anything. And for various reasons, the story structure changed several times and I had trouble keeping the scenario in check. You might think that a scenario should be written from start to finish after you've decided on everything, but in reality, it doesn't go like that. As you write, you suddenly start to see things in a way that you had never considered before, as if driven by a mysterious energy. Could be Holmes' energy? Mystery fiction is about surprises, but even I was sometimes shocked by what I had come up with, sometimes more surprising than the surprises I myself had planned, so you can expect the unexpected from the story. I've been making games for 20 years now, so by now you'd think I'd be better at controlling this creation process, though. And surprise people, he did. But there were a lot of hurdles in development. The script was considered massive by Takumi's standards, reaching a total of 30 hours in playtime compared to the series' usual 20 hours. Naturally, all these changes create a real hassle for the asset developers. They had to keep creating models for characters and backgrounds that they weren't even sure would make it into the final game. The art style ended up taking a different turn compared to previous entries in the series as well. Nothing would be hand drawn, and all of the characters would use motion capture instead of rigging and animation. The goal was for them to act naturally and realistically while still having their manga like designs. 
The clothing at the time was limited too, and the artist Kazuya Nuri ended up having to bring out their personality in different ways while still keeping their fashion to the time period. The camera work was revamped as well, often moving around the courtroom instead of simply just looking at the judge, the defense, and the prosecution. Because of this, it was necessary to add a lot more detail to the character models in the case of zoom from the camera. The goal was to make the courtroom look truly alive instead of just a PNG image. There was a lot on their plate, but the final product eventually came out on July 9th, 2015. But how did this game make its way overseas? Let's take a look. In The Great Ace Attorney, the year is 1899. You start the game as Ryunosuke Naruhoto, a student in the English Department of Imperial Yumei University, and the ancestor of Phoenix Wright. While you're not exactly a law student, certain circumstances led you to having to take the place of your best friend, Kazuma Osogi, as an attorney on an exchange trip to the Great British Empire. Like the original Ace Attorney games, you stumble across murder cases that you have to solve in order to save your client. In one of these cases, you meet the renowned Sherlock Holmes, resulting in the two of you teaming up to solve various murders. Cases are typically split up into an investigation section and a trial section, where you then use the evidence you gathered to prove your client's innocence. That's an extremely watered down summary of the game, but none of it seems outrageous enough for it to be locked in Japan, right? Well, that's not exactly true. There are three big reasons as to why this game was never localized. The first is the existence of Sherlock Holmes. In Japan, current copyright laws make Sherlock Holmes public domain, but here in America, Holmes is still under copyright protection since there were 10 side stories published after 1923. Technically, the character Sherlock Holmes should be legal to use, but <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but this is just funny as hell, but increments of expression that further delineated the characters and story were found to be subject to copyright protections. That basically means that if more stories are created that continue to develop a character in a written works universe, the copyright extends to that character's most recent venture rather than its creation. And personally, I found that incredibly stupid because that would mean Mickey Mouse will never be public domain. The US copyright laws are a mess. However, this may be a misunderstanding in that copyright laws can only apply to a later character in the game since that later character was created in one of these side stories. It could very well be that this character was subject to copyright protections rather than Sherlock. Well, no matter. What is important is that the Conan Doyle estate is rather keen on collecting their fees, so publishing any game involving Sherlock Holmes' property would result in getting sued. Hell, even this video might- You get my point. These stories will continue to be copyrighted until 2023, where it will then be completely legal to use Sherlock Holmes in a story. The second reason as to why this game was never localized would be due to the odd localization of the Ace Attorney series. In the American localization of Ace Attorney, the game takes place in Los Angeles, not Tokyo, despite many Japanese references and cultural activities taking place over the course of the story, sometimes to the point where it makes the jelly-filled donut scene in Pokemon look realistic. Eat your hamburgers, Apollo. Because of this, it makes it rather difficult to say that Ryunosuke Naruhoto is an American man in a fledgling court system in 1899, when the court system was already well established by that point. It wouldn't make sense in the grand scheme of things. Because of this, it would be impossible to localize DGS and have it make sense to the casual fans of Ace Attorney that don't know about the localization. But the final, and perhaps biggest reason of all, is just... It wouldn't make enough money to justify investing all those resources. After the release of Apollo Justice, the series was reduced to digital only in the West due to a lack of sales, which in turn killed even more sales. Investing resources into a spin-off title would most likely not earn enough money to justify an entire translation project. With all these barriers stacking on top of each other, Daigyakut and Saibon was destined to fade into obscurity. Or so you would think. In November of 2020, there was a large leak of confidential Capcom info regarding the Ace Attorney series. If this leak is to be believed, there should be an announcement of a faithful port of the Great Ace Attorney in April of 2021 and a release window of July 2021. In order to get around the copyright issues, Sherlock Holmes would be renamed to Herlock Sholmes, which is a clever reference to Maurice Leblanc's novel Arsène Lupin vs. Herlock Sholmes, in which Leblanc used Herlock Sholmes to get around copyright. If this leak is to be believed, then we could potentially be seeing a release. Regarding the other two reasons, Capcom could just disregard the American localization entirely and use the fact that the Great Ace Attorney is in its own universe to disregard canon. And while the sales could be a potential concern, the Ace Attorney Trilogy HD sold extremely well, which could serve as proof that there is renewed interest in the series. The barriers could break down, but for now they still exist. Therefore, let's look at how people have circumvented these barriers. After DGS released in 2015 and there was no official news of a Western translation, a few members came together on GBA Temp and created the tools necessary to alter the game's code. The tools were shoddy, but it was enough to get the ball rolling. Many members came and went, but there was a complete lack of organization. The then DGS team joined with Team If, the team that worked on the initial translation of Fire Emblem Fates, but it still took half a year to release a translation of the demo. It was a slow start, and the team soon disbanded from Team If due to the teams not clicking well. 
the project kept slowly burning until a few members of Fan Translators International, namely Neo Bayo, An Error, Icy Sun 55, and One Piece Freak, jumped on the project around the halfway point, resulting in a dramatic improvement in the tools and making an Android port possible. And eventually, the finalized team looked like this. But even with all this help, DGS was shaping up to be a different sort of beast compared to the previous projects. Uobami said, It would be very difficult to fit DGS into the existing Ace Attorney Japanifornia universe. We are aware of other people trying to do just that, but let's leave it at this. It's not what we want to do. But let me clarify one thing people get wrong. We are, in fact, localizing DGS. We try to make jokes and puns work and rewrite things to make them more accessible to the end user. What we do not do is Americanize it. As in, we do not change the location, and we avoid changing the nationality of any character. Generally, we don't change the names of the characters, as many are references to the Sherlock Holmes universe, but there are exceptions. Though for the currently released episodes, there is only one. This one character only ended up being a cat, so in the grand scheme it didn't really matter much. Hyaryan also gave his thoughts on this, saying, At any rate, if I can add my personal thoughts on our localization approach, I feel like adding in that extra layer of Japanifornia would get in the way of presenting a clear and accurate representation of the original game. We're only a small team, after all, and not professionals. Many lines had to be changed in order to bring out the personalities of the characters, which would have been lost in translation if translated literally. A good example of this phenomenon is in anime, where it's much more cute to call someone Onichan rather than Big Brother. However, careful consideration needs to be taken to make sure that it doesn't go too overboard and go into cringy 90s fan subtitles level. There were also many cultural jokes and examples of wordplay that only exist in Japanese and would be extremely difficult to translate. For example, in the first case, one of the witnesses is an English exchange student named Giselle Brett. Although Narahodo and Cosma both know English, Giselle uses the fancier Queen's English, which is basically a new language to them. In the original game, she initially just spoke English, and used a cursive gibberish font for when she spoke Queen's English. In order to make standard English still feel alien to the player, the team created a second cursive font that was barely legible, even to native English speakers. The entire game is filled with these nuances, which makes it one of the most daunting tasks in terms of translation. There was also the issue of being sued by the Dolan estate for making this translation, but considering the fact that fan translation is already an illegal grey area, this wasn't really taken into consideration. The translations were gradually released over the course of two years, but development was really set into motion with Scarlet Steady releasing cases 3 and 4 at once on September 22, 2018. Considering that case 2 was released in December of 2017, most had thought the project had been cancelled, but that was really the moment the Ace Attorney community collectively said, oh shit, they're really doing this. The final patch for the 3DS release was posted on March 22, 2019, with the Android patch releasing on April 4, 2019. Luckily, I was given the opportunity to ask the staff of Scarlet's Day some questions about who they are and how they made the translation, including Perry, Rocky, Singleton, Edo, XZ, Tikro, Uobami, Hank37, and Star Stabbed Moon. I asked them how they got into fan translating in the first place, but it turns out it isn't that complicated, with the general consensus being that they just did the thing. It's pretty easy to get involved with fan translating as long as you have the skills. After all, during translation you end up doing a lot of improv anyway, so if there are any of you that end up wanting to get into this field, just don't be too intimidated. Just do the thing. As for how they got to translating DGS in the first place, XZ said, We spent a solid year just working on the first episode of the first game. Personally for me, I watched subtitled videos of a DGS playthrough on YouTube, and I knew this game was special. Around the same time the sequel released, and I heard many great things about it. We kept trying to recruit new members, hoping to find the right talent to do the job, and we got lucky. That's the gist of how we were formed. Uobami tagged in, saying the project started with a few modders on GBA temp trying to figure out how the game works and making the first tools to work with the assets. That began pretty much when the game released in Japan, since the writing was already on the wall that it would not be localized back then. Some of them met on Skype to form Team that merged with Team If, who was translating Fire Emblem If slash Fates when it became known that the English localization would be changed drastically in order to get some structure into the efforts, since none had really led a game translation team before. A few translators from there joined our efforts, but in general the synergies we were hoping for did not happen, so we split off to form our own team again in early 2017, and shortly after that gave ourselves the name Scarlet Steady. I was wondering if they had any sort of rules or guidelines put down at the beginning regarding the vision of the translation, but it turns out it's a lot more freeform than you would think. If there's an opportunity to slip in an appropriate joke pun or reference, you take it! We have guidelines for stylistic choices in our translation. For example, we tend to stick to UK English more often than not in most cases. The guidelines developed naturally while we were still figuring things out. Since none of us had ever led a translation team, we figured things out along the way. Some things we had to vote on, others were unanimous. Making Giselle speak French instead of Queen's English was an idea we kicked around briefly in order to make an English-speaking audience feel like the Japanese-speaking audience, but it was quickly abandoned. Not Americanizing, DGS was nearly unanimous, the sole dissenter had never played the game before. 
For everyone who had played it, this was a no-brainer, and Capcom now doing it in quite a similar fashion is validating this IMHO. A nice change that made our translation unique was transitioning to British English near the end of the GDS1 translation and giving select characters a distinct dialect. The complete script had to be rewritten to make this work, but judging from the reaction of our audience, it was worth it. But how did all these efforts come together? What's the process of translation here? I'm not sure how much detail I can share, but we have a system in place where members choose which parts of the game they want to work on. Everyone has different roles that narrow down what kind of work they usually do, like translators, editors, testers, and so on. There's a lot of overlap with these roles, so for some members they could be editing something and then testing later. To be honest, with this system it isn't very difficult at all. People often get busy with school and other life stuff, so their time becomes very limited, but we have a lot of hardworking and passionate members who can help balance everything out. Initially, our translation was based on the script of a YouTube translation, which we use with permission, of course. It was corrected by other translators and edited to fit. This turned out to be the wrong approach, and we moved on to translate from scratch. Nowadays, every script file goes through seven steps. First, we generate an Excel sheet from the script file, then it's translated, then another translator checks the work of the initial translator, then it's reinserted into the script file and added to fit, then it's proofread by someone else, then tested on hardware to make sure there are no crashes or soft locks, and finally, yet another translator, who hasn't touched this file before, checks the finished translation against the original Japanese to make sure the editing process didn't go off the path. When we feel the script is ready, we invite some of the friends of the team who are not involved otherwise to beta test everything with fresh eyes. They usually spot everything we miss, and once we fix everything they report, we release. Every release also contains fixes our users report to us after the previous release. Of course, this would lead to many challenges for the team. The custom GUI framework the game uses, it's a messy file format involving serialization. It also didn't help that we had to apply several patches to the game binary, at least once to fix bugs in the game. Our low-level hacksaws really deserve applause for their incredible work. I'm a big C-sharp developer, use it for the majority of my coding life, but I was an awful Android developer. My concerns are definitely going to sound trivial when compared to the others, but my biggest challenge was just to get some GUIs on Iris Mobile to do what they should be doing. I got way better at using Xamarin by now, and that is no longer a concern, and I thank all of Scarlet Stay for giving me this opportunity. As someone who worked mainly on the first case of DGS1, I was worried I wouldn't set the right tone for the core cast. Giving everyone a distinct voice so that the players could imagine the characters saying their lines with no trouble was my biggest challenge. One of the biggest challenges for me would be staying motivated to keep on working. It isn't really that big of a challenge because of all the support and praise we often receive, but it is a fairly huge project. I'm simply glad that I have my teammates who would keep going forward even when I lose my resolve. They're truly dependable. The biggest challenge was getting the right people for the job and getting everyone in a workflow that actually worked. Like I said before, none of us had ever managed a fan translation team, so it took us quite a while to figure things out. We did have big problems on the technical side for a long time, and we had to make do with makeshift mods until we found people to get the job done right. But they're not exactly done with translating DGS just yet. There have been plans for a while to make an English dub of the game as well as translating the game into other languages. I was curious as to whether this was always planned or if the scope of the project broadened due to the translation's success. After we released the translated demo for DGS1, we were approached by people to help them with retranslating our script to other languages. We did help a Spanish team do that with our demo, but we decided not to allow a retranslation of the main game until the script was stable enough. Every time we make a release, users find mistakes we fix in subsequent releases and we improve and rewrite the script all the time. These changes and improvements will get lost downstream. We do feel like the DGS1 script is pretty stable now though. We did consider a dub early on, but we always intended it to be optional. Naturally, since this project was a big undertaking, I wondered how the team managed to actually stay motivated. Tons of my friends are Ace Attorney fans, so anytime I remembered they were counting on us to be able to play the game, I felt really motivated to push forward. I used to replay the DGS series translation every time I lost motivation. Helps a lot to remember how cool the Scarlet Studies work is. The two things that motivated me the most were both all the Ace Attorney fans who support us, enjoy our work, and find meaning in our work, as well as the man who started this series, Shu Takumi. This entry is one of his greatest contributions to gaming, and we were all worried on some level that the vast majority of his own fans would never get to experience this work of art. Whatever the future holds, I'm thankful that we were able to give that experience to so many people. Tech on my colleagues, definitely the fans who would otherwise not be able to enjoy Takumi's historical drama brainchild. I tried to do things that would make 15 year old me proud. One big step forward for me personally when we finished the first game. Later that year, I went to an anime convention where I met a group of Ace Attorney fans in person who loved our work. It was a very happy moment. I always liked the series, but DGS is really a much needed breath of fresh air. I wanted to help make it possible for people who don't know Japanese to enjoy the game as much as I did. There were translated scripts before, but it just wasn't the same as playing it yourself. The reactions we got from our user base carried us along. It was really great to see people appreciate all the little details we worked on. We weren't sure anyone would notice, but they sure did. After the release of the final episode, the project exploded. 
If I had to guess, it was due to multiple factors, such as the release of the Ace Attorney trilogy on PC and modern platforms, as well as the influence of YouTubers such as Nico B playing through the entire game. Not to mention the extremely passionate fanbase on Twitter, Tumblr, and Reddit. It gained its own cult following. Since I had originally gotten into DGS due to the YouTube subtitles and later transitioned into buying the actual game, I was fascinated by the sudden support. I asked the team about whether they expected this. Before we released the demo for DGS 1, a lot of people disagreed with our decision not to Americanize DGS the way all the other games in the series had been, including the Great Ace Attorney Investigation Suvan translation. Not all of us were confident people would accept it, but after people got to play the game themselves, virtually everyone understood why we made that decision and the complaints died down almost instantly. We were amazed about the reaction to our work. Personally, I didn't expect it to blow up as much as it did. And finally, we reached the most important question. Who is your favorite DGS character? I personally like Holmes the best. He's such a delightful interpretation of the character, plus his eccentricity makes him really fun to translate. I second Holmes. He's such a goofball that you're curious as to what crazy thing he'll do next, yet there are clear signs that there's more to him underneath the surface. I unironically think Holmes is one of the best characters the Ace Attorney series has seen to date. I love his design, and his personality and writing are just a blast both to experience and to translate. All my fellow members said Holmes, and I'll do the same. I laugh so much every time he appears because of how quirky his interactions with the world are. And it gets even better in the second game, let me tell you that. I I'm gonna deviate a bit and say Asogi. I had the privilege of retranslating most of his lines and grew attached to him in the process. Not to mention, I'm a huge fan of his voice actor, Yuichi Nakamura. Shout out to Gina too, who I think is one of the best designed female characters in the franchise. I have to choose one? But I love Gina, Iris, Holmes, Van Zeeks. Well, if there was one I had to pick, it would be Suzuto. Maya was my favorite for years in the main series, and as the assistant archetype, she nails it more than the others in my opinion. She's also a lot more fleshed out as a character with her own motivations and sense of justice. She's funny, cute, reliable, and smart. Honestly, one of the most underrated characters ever. Sorry, another Holmes fan here. The game has inspired me to read the entirety of the Sherlock Holmes collection, and I'd say Shu Takumi captured Holmes' personality to near perfection. He's funny, brilliant, and endearingly eccentric, and that I always just look forward to what he'll do next. Everybody loves Holmes. He's also my favorite. I do think people underestimate Iris, though. Maybe that'll change once more people have finished DGS 2. Well, with this, it's confirmed. Holmes is, in fact, the best character. Scarlet Stay said it themselves. Real glad we can finally sell that debate. But we still have one more question. Is there anything the team wants to tell anyone who would be watching this documentary? We hope you enjoyed our work, or will in the future. While we do wish that Capcom has big success with their localization, so those games will keep on coming, our translation can possibly serve as an alternative that people can enjoy alongside of it. Please do support Capcom's work if and when it comes out, because niche game series like Ace Attorney need all the support they can get. We are really looking forward to checking out how they decide to translate certain parts of the game we pondered over, and will be first in line if and when it comes out. I want to give my sincere thanks to everyone at Scarlet Steady for willing to give me their answers despite how difficult things are for DGS and the future translation. All the people who worked on this game are absolutely fantastic. Please go and download the translation in the description and support them wherever possible. While I wish I could have found more details on the actual development of the game, I just couldn't find anything else that was really of note. In English, anyway. There was an art book made for this game, but it's rather difficult to get your hands on at a reasonable price. There aren't any fan translations of it either. Well, maybe if I actually bothered with my Duolingo lessons, I wouldn't have had as much of a problem. Now, on to the actual game review. Go! The game starts with an anime cutscene that looks absolutely gorgeous. You're shown the streets of Japan in the year 1899 as the camera moves around, showing the environment and how Japan has adapted to modern society. You're then shown the inside of a western diner. A gunshot rings out, and a man's hand falls off his chair. The visitors of the establishment hall look towards the center of the room, where you then see our protagonist standing over the corpse of the victim, holding a gun in hand. Already, you set up the facts of the case in less than a minute, and you're whisked away to the courtroom lobby. It's time for the trial of Ryunosuke Narihodo. But since the year is 1899, defense attorneys haven't exactly existed until that point, so it's rather difficult to find one. Luckily, your best friend Cosmo Sohi has come to your aid as a law student of Yumei University. He's known for his outstanding talent, having already earned his attorney's badge and is about to go to the Great British Empire as an exchange student. However, after conversing with his teacher, Professor Mikotoba, in the defendant's lobby, he discovered that if he loses this trial, he would then be immediately dropped as an exchange student. While this seems unrealistic, this is due to the tense political situation of Japan and Great Britain at the time. It would be incredibly insulting to send the failure of an attorney to the British Empire as an exchange student. And, of course, the currently small island nation of Japan wants to be on great terms with the enormous British Empire. Because of this, Professor Mikotoba advises Nadehodo to act as his own attorney in court, just in case the defense is too difficult. Nadehodo, being the selfless guy he is, agrees, yelling to the court that he will act as his own attorney. This marks the start of your journey as a substitute attorney. 
The facts of the case are laid out as Nadahodo and Asogi listen in on the proceedings. The various witnesses are brought in, and Asogi starts to show you the ropes of being a defense attorney. This is where the gameplay really starts to heat up. And by gameplay, I mean text boxes with 3D models moving about. This is a visual novel, after all. After a quick tutorial of the controls, you hear the testimony of a few witnesses and begin the cross-examination. In these segments, you'll hear the statements of the witnesses, and will either have to press them for more information, or present evidence proving that it was a lie or that the witness was misremembering. This is how you progress through the trial. As you go on, you may gain new evidence or discover new meanings to old evidence. You slowly go through the timeline of events and piece together the full story through the witness testimony. As the story goes on and you begin piecing more events together, the orchestral soundtrack starts to really heat up. And all I have to say is, hats off to the music team. The music is incredibly fitting for every situation in the game, yet is strong enough on its own for me to want to actually listen to it in my spare time. Now that is the sign of a great OST. And as the trial goes on, the tempo begins to increase along with the tension as you get closer and closer to finding the truth, and it really helps with the immersion of chasing after the culprit. Watching everything unfold from the music, the plot, and the characters all at once is just an absolute treat. The characters themselves have really impressive animations that really tell you what said characters are like. While you would expect there to be minimal movement due to the focus on the game being on the text, there were entire sequences of movement that really add to the game, such as Naruhodo's pacing around the courtroom, or some of the witnesses' reactions to the statements. The animations and camera work have improved considerably compared to Ace Attorney 5 and Ace Attorney Professor's Professor Layton. It feels like the team is taking a lot more liberties and goes with whatever they think suits the character the most instead of going with whatever is the most dramatic. But as you progress through the story, more gameplay mechanics begin to introduce themselves. There are multiple witnesses on the stand, which was another mechanic used in the crossover title Professor Layton vs. Phoenix Wright. If a witness notices a difference in what they remember while another witness is talking, they'll tend to think. At this point, you can ask that particular witness about their opinion and discover new information. However, unlike in Layton vs. Wright, DGS never really uses this mechanic to the fullest potential. It's just, oh, he's thinking, better ask him and progress the plot! And as that plot progresses, this first case in particular has a lot of issues. I know that this is a spoiler-free section, but a general overview of the first case is important to know, as it is rather lackluster in comparison with the rest of the game. I think I would be rather remiss not to give a general overview about strengths and flaws, as I don't want anyone to go into the game and end up thinking that I lied to them about how good it is. I'll be doing the same for some aspects of Case 2 and a tiny bit of Case 3, but I won't be giving any details about the plot, characters, or the case itself, so don't worry about that. I'll get this out of the way first. This first case is way too fucking long. <laughs> By around the halfway point, you've already figured out who did it and how they did it, but you're left trying to prove the rest of the crime as you and the killer debate back and forth what feels like an eternity. I get that Takumi probably wanted the player to feel invested and motivated to take down the killer, but once it takes 69 no use to do it, it becomes a little bit tiresome. Learning more about the crime as the trial goes on with those sudden aha moments is what makes the Ace Attorney gameplay loop so addicting, but this just drags. And since the entire first case is just a single trial, it doesn't help that you're essentially doing the same thing over and over for roughly 4-5 to five hours with no breaks in gameplay or anything to break the tension. Another complaint I have is the real lack of turnabouts or weird mindfucks in the case. It's rather linear in its progression as you cross-examine witnesses one after the other like they're on an assembly line before cross-examining the same witness for nearly the entire last half. There are twists and turns, but nothing that you can't see coming. There were no red herrings or anything, it was just obstacles and contradictions in your way that you need to get rid of. And since it's happening so many times, it becomes tedious and frustrating rather than exciting. Near the end of the trial, it goes on an especially long detour about something seemingly irrelevant. <sighs> but I am making it sound a lot worse than it really is. The story is still engaging, the soundtrack is still bumping, the charm is off the chain, the characters are witty, the culprit has swagger, the tension is still there, but I just think this is the lowest point of the game. If you get past the first trial, it literally only goes up from there. And it's not even bad, it's just that it's okay compared to the rest of the game. I mean, there have definitely been worse cases in the Ace Attorney series, it's just that this is a real letdown of a first case and not a good way to get anyone introduced into the game. Anyways, as the trial goes on, we get to see Nadahodo start to finally get into the swing of things. You see his growth as an attorney as his desk slams go from piddly knocks on wood to sound effects that strike fear into the hearts of evil. Hisogi begins to see this potential in him, and by the end of the trial, Hisogi is convinced that he should probably change his career, offering to even smuggle him on his ship to the British Empire. However, there was a sudden change in circumstance, causing Nadahodo to have to take his place as an exchange student, along with Hisogi's legal assistant, Suzuto. On the boat, the two meet the famous Sherlock Holmes, and the three of them team up to solve a murder case that transpired on the way to Britain. The entire second case is a single investigation sequence, but this time it doesn't feel drawn out since there's a lot of variance to the gameplay and story. There are lots of jokes and japes to break the tension, sudden events that cause things to go wrong, and plenty of ways for the story to diverge. In the investigation sequences, the game turns to a point-and-click game similar to Professor Layton. You can examine, move, talk, and present evidence all with the push of the touchscreen. 
You gain a little bit of control over the flow of the game since you get free reign to inspect whatever evidence you want and interrogate any persons of interest you desire. You can shift your viewpoint to examine all corners of the room, check evidence already in inventory, and uncover more of the truth. However, the two of you discover that Sherlock isn't exactly what he seems. He's incredibly eccentric and rushes everything, causing him to make mistakes in logic and, well, hang from coat hooks. Holmes offers to make deductions throughout the case, destroying opponents with his facts and logic, where it becomes your job to correct where his logic goes wrong. At first, you listen to whatever his nonsensical theories are and just enjoy the ride. Then you get to listen to his theories a second time, but wherever he uses irrelevant evidence, it becomes your job to interject and deduce what the real reason behind certain characters' actions were, diverting from the timeline and coming up with a new argument as you go. This is easily one of my favorite parts of the investigation sequences, as the background darkens and the spotlight shines in the good detective and Nadahoto as they deduce the facts of the case with flair and pizzazz. The moment one of these gameplay sections occur, I would always get excited and think, oh shit, we're, we're doing the thing! It's always an incredibly cool moment that feels like you're coming up with the deductions yourself and is a welcome change of pace compared to just constantly proving people wrong in the trials. And that's pretty much the cycle of case two. Do some investigating, do a super cool sequence with Holmes, do some more investigating, do another sequence with Holmes, and that's the entire case. But another strength of this formula is that we get to see a lot more of the side characters compared to the trials since there isn't nearly as much of a rush. You really get to know the thoughts of Holmes and the different people you encounter. Hell, even Naruhoto gets some good dialogue. You get some actually really good-ass character development too. If this case didn't exist, I don't think I'd be nearly as attached to the different characters as I am now. Case 2 is also the point in which the music changes significantly. It's still performed by an orchestra, but there's a lot more variance in these investigation sections as you get to hear the main themes of the many different characters and experience more light-hearted beats instead of just the exclusively tension-building, fearful, triumphant, and methodical tunes of the trials. Sometimes there isn't even any music at all when deemed appropriate. Overall, I really do think that the soundtrack is the best part of this game. While I do appreciate the classic bit crunch tunes of the earliest attorney games and the synth slash orchestral versions of later games, the tone and musical style of DGS feels dramatic and pronounced, yet it also knows when to back off. Each character's theme feels distinct and unique, and I'm not sure what else to say about it except that it quote unquote hits different. But Case 3 is where shit really kicks into high gear. I'm not going to say much, but what I can go over is that Case 3 introduces another mechanic, which in my opinion is the best addition they've added to Trials so far. The juror system. No, I'm not talking about the jury bullshit from Apollo Justice that was forgotten by the series, I'm talking about an actual honest-to-god juror system. Each jury member needs to be convinced of the defendant's innocence, which creates an interesting hurdle. As the plot progresses, jurors will change their stance of guilty or innocent. When all jurors select guilty, the trial ends and your client is declared guilty. However, it's at these points you have the ability to create a closing argument and try to convince the witnesses one last time that your client is innocent or that the trial is being ended prematurely. Each of the jurors states their basis for their verdict, and it becomes your job to clash the jurors' statements with each other to prove that something is amiss. If over half the jurors change their verdict to innocent, then the trial continues. While this mechanic has potential, I feel like the execution of it was a little bit botched. Because you end up having to compare statements, it's rather easy to spot the contradiction, unlike comparing evidence and testimony where you have to put two and two together to find the contradiction. And if it's not, then you just keep pressing them until it does. For example, you get two jurors saying that the victim was killed by X, and another says that the victim was killed by Y. Another complaint that I have is that a lot of the information gained from the closing argument feels contrived, as the jurors tend to have relevant information to share that was unknown to the court, despite being randomly selected among the citizenry. It happens way too often for my liking. But the closing argument has some really cool aspects to it too. In the background, there's this golden scale in which the jurors send their verdicts. The more guilty verdicts, the more it tilts towards the left. It physically tracks how screwed over you are. It has this great feeling of tension as you really feel your back pressed up against the wall. You see the members of the court actively taking a stance against you and it feels like you've been swimming in a nice aquarium with manta rays and clownfish, only to find that it's also infested with sharks. In previous Ace Attorney games, you would see the evidence pile up against you which would create that tension, but since you can visibly see how cornered you are with the existence of the closing argument and the grand scale, the tension just feels that much more palpable. Often you'll find the jury slowly edging towards a guilty verdict as they change their stances during the trial, which also helps with that feeling. And of course, the further you get in the game, the more closing arguments you have to perform. It really feels like you're flying by at the seat of your pants. Plus, it just feels really good to have a grand turnabout right at that moment and tell the jurors to hold my beer. Now, I've been going along with the game in chronological order, but I won't be saying a single thing about cases 4 and 5 other than that they're good, and really good. So, let's just talk about the game as a whole. The game's overarching plot is rather superb. I don't think it's quite the level of Ace Attorney Investigations 2, as it's limited only to the events of cases 3 and 5, and to some small extent, case 4, but it is still incredible in terms of the insane twists and turns that it takes. In that aspect, I would actually consider it to be superior than Ace Attorney Investigations 2. 
The stakes feel real, and the events feel much more sinister in comparison to the rest of the series. Those of you that played the game know what I'm talking about. My only issue with it is that cases 1 and 2 aren't as connected to the overall plot as I feel like they could be. And all jokes aside, that's pretty much all my thoughts on everything that doesn't include the plot. At this point, I hope that I've genuinely convinced you that DGS is a game worth playing. This is the point in which you should stop the video if you're going to play the game for yourself, as I'm going to fully dissect the plot of the game and critique it. If you're going to play the game, I recommend you order a copy of 3DS from an import site such as PlayAsia or Amazon. I would recommend just downloading the Android version due to the superior graphics, but Capcom updated the mobile version in March of 2020, completely breaking the patch that Scarlet Steady made. Unfortunately, they have not yet gotten around to fixing it. Check the website to see if the patch has been released. If you're getting the game on 3DS, be sure that you are willing to homebrew it, or that you really know your way around Citra. Or if you had no other choice, I guess you could watch a Let's Play or walkthrough of it. Personally, I would recommend someone like Nico B if you want something more bombastic and insane, or Monoka Dobo for someone more chill. I would love to recommend Source Gaming, as they're fucking hilarious, but they stopped their playthrough at the beginning of Case 4 due to the lack of views. That's your hint to go check them out if this video doesn't die in the YouTube algorithm. Or I guess you could just watch a no commentary walkthrough if you're into that sort of thing, I guess. Alright, links for those are in the description. Now, on to the spoiler review. I'm going to give a quick disclaimer here. If you just skipped this part, know that I'm going to be discussing the story. All gameplay, music, and presentation was in the non spoiler section. Let's start with the facts of Case 1. Nadahodo and Asogi went to a western restaurant named Quantos to celebrate Asogi being picked from the exchange program. Asogi leaves, and as Nadahodo is about to head out, he sees a professor from his university, a man named John H. Watson. Yes, that John H. Watson. Nadahodo decides to go say hello for no particular reason and finishes with the conversation before going back to his coffee. But when he starts to leave, he sees a western pistol on the floor. Thinking that the good professor had dropped it, he turns around to hand it back when the sound of a gunshot rings out. The professor was shot, and since Nadahodo was right in front of him holding a gun, he's the prime suspect. The waiter, Satoto Hosunaga, promptly detains him before asking the other two customers to inform the police. And I really like how this case starts. It isn't as simple as in other case attorney cases. Typically, when you or your assistant are the suspect, it's usually just because one of you was the first to discover the body and someone else saw you there. But in this case, you're standing there, nuts hanging out, gun in hand, literally at point blank range from the victim. This feels a lot more dangerous because of that. Once the trial starts, you can tell that there's much more than meets the eye. The entire court is composed of military officials and political leaders. This is because of the recently signed Anglo-Japanese treaty between the British and Japanese empires. The victim was a well-respected Brit who was invited to teach at a Japanese university, so naturally the Japanese government wants the case to be settled as quickly as possible in order to appease the British Empire. I think this is one of the best aspects of the first case, as it definitely has some of the best world-building in Ace Attorney. You instantly understand the ramifications of your trial and that this trial goes beyond just your own life, and may very well have lasting political effects if anything goes wrong. This applies to your friend Asogi as well, as apparently the political tension is so thick that sending an underqualified exchange student to the British Empire would be perceived as insulting. That's why it's important that he either wins as your defense, or doesn't have the opportunity to stand as your defense. Not only does this first half hour of the game set up the stage and tone for the rest of the game, but it actually gives a good reason as to why Nadahodo dips his toes into the world of law in the first place. Now, the first witness is called Hosonaga, the waiter. He's composed, enthusiastic, probably has tuberculosis, but he's very passionate! His screen time is rather short, unfortunately, as he only starts to give the facts of the case, such as where everyone was standing, how he detained Nadahodo, etc. The next two witnesses, Sergeant Uzukumaru and Sanmon Sono Higarashi, serve to tell the court why it was Nadahodo that killed the professor. The trial goes on, and all the witnesses state that since the victim was shot at point blank range, only Nadahodo could have shot him since he was near the victim. But Nadahodo remembers that there was actually a woman saying across for them. Naturally, the player begins to think that since Nadahodo didn't kill him, and all the other witnesses couldn't have killed him due to the gunpowder burns, then it must have been the woman who killed Professor Watson. Great job, you already figured out who did it and how they did it, not even halfway through the trial. Wow! Personally, I feel like this takes out a lot from the trial since you're legitimately just struggling to pin the evidence to her for the remaining two and a half to three hours. The first hour is spent trying to prove that she exists and why the witnesses can't talk about her. Turns out, the waiter Hosunaga was a detective for the Imperial Police, who uses influence to silence the other witnesses about her presence. He was ordered to do so by the government since getting another Briton involved that didn't seem connected to the case could lead to potential complications down the line. Zukumaru and Sony Higurashi are pretty cool witnesses, but I wish we got to talk with Hosunaga more. He's a great detective with a lovable personality. I think he's probably my third favorite detective in the series, only beaten out by Gumshoe and Shilong Lang. Sorry, Fulbright. Uh, he really cares about his job and evidence preservation. His motives are admirable, and you can tell he really cares for his job despite clearly having a chronic illness. Hell, you wouldn't have been able to win the trial if Hosunaka wasn't there to store the evidence despite it being against protocol. 
Best boy Hosonaga! Anyway, you end up proving that the woman was, in fact, at the scene of the crime, since there was a dish of beefsteak at the table, yet according to a medical report, Professor Watson was unable to eat any sort of solid food for a few hours. Not only that, but it was covered up by Hosonaga, who was in actuality a detective who ordered the witnesses to stay silent about the woman since she was a British exchange student. Again, bringing the politics back into this really shows just how eager the Japanese government is to appease the British and strengthen their relations. But all of your efforts result in you being able to finally bring Miss Giselle Brett to the stand. I would say that she is definitely one of the more fun villains we've had in this series. She's incredibly polite, but doesn't hesitate to slide in some underlying insults in her words. She knows that you suspect her, but she fully admits it in her conduct, as she continuously taunts you throughout the trial. By the end, it feels like she's just slinging straight venom at you as she keeps shutting down your theories and evidence. The trial continues, and it turns out that the professor had his hand on the iron skillet underneath the meat for at least three seconds, resulting in him essentially being branded. However, he did not scream at any point when at the restaurant, which leads you to believe that the victim died of poison rather than gunshot, but the victim had already been tested for poison with all known Japanese poisons. Turns out that Miss Brett had poisoned him with a South American poison known as Curar that is currently unknown to Japan. I actually really like this idea, it makes you feel powerless and really feel the limits of technology, which is one of the selling points of the game. But then, Giselle Brett ends up breaking the bottle that the poison was in, resulting in them being unable to properly test for it. Again, I think this is a great idea, but poor in execution as it forced the trial to go on for even longer. As a result, you end up having to argue for the next hour over whether a beefsteak plate with blood in it was switched from the victim's table or not in order to prove that Giselle was the one who fired the gun. I wouldn't have minded this if it wasn't so drawn out. I wouldn't have felt nearly as burned by this case if you were able to prove that the plates were switched only like two to three cross-examinations after Giselle broke the bottle. Instead, you have to scroll through more text and perform like seven cross-examinations. Overall, this case was the epitome of great idea, bad execution. If I was able to make any changes to this trial, I would have had Giselle leave the restaurant before Nadehodo and shoot Watson from an open window instead as Nadehodo picks up the gun. That way, the player would actively suspect the other witnesses instead of just Giselle since there was no gunpowder burn, and the player would only discover her existence over halfway through the trial since Nadehodo wouldn't have thought she was relevant until thinking about why the beefsteak is at the table. It would have kept the mystery at least a little bit longer. I would have also shortened down some sections as there's a lot of repeat phrasing, and my god I don't care about how this Koban got stuck under that other plate of beefsteak. Fuck be sick. I'm never eating it for as long as I live. I'm done. We're, we're done. Case two, case one over. In case two, Asogi has just left Japan and is currently on the boat for the month that it would take to reach Great Britain. However, he smuggles Nadehodo into one of his suitcases because he just couldn't bear to be without his best friend. It's nothing more than that, it's purely platonic, I swear. I mean, do you just leave your homies all alone while you go on your exchange trip? Of course not. I mean, I, I make sure to take all my homies on vacations to foreign countries with just the two of us, don't you? <laughs> uh. Anyway, uh, Nadehodo spends all of his time in Asogi's cabin, eating parts of Asogi's food and having to sleep in a wardrobe so as not to be discovered by the sailors. After about two weeks have passed, Nadehodo goes to sleep like usual, and Asogi slams a do not open posted note on the wardrobe. However, when morning arrives, Nadehodo awakens with a pounding in his head, hands cuffed to a chair, and Asogi is nowhere to be seen. You can already see where this is going. Asogi's legal assistant, Suzato Mikotoba, informs you that Asogi's body was just found this morning on the floor in front of the wardrobe, with a dying message saying, wardrobe, in Russian? But not only that, but the room was locked from the inside when the body was discovered. Naturally, since Nadehodo was 1. a stowaway, 2. found at the scene of the crime, and 3. locked in the room with the body, shit goes south real fast. Nadehodo, of course, wants to investigate the scene in order to prove his innocence, but can't, so he tries to get Suzato on his side. He shows her the post-it note on the door and says that because it was on the outside, he couldn't have left the wardrobe, killed it, so he got back in the wardrobe and then put this post-it note back on. Therefore, he could have only been in the wardrobe the entire night. This isn't enough to prove his innocence due to some other evidence, but it gives him permission to investigate along with some accompaniment. As he investigate, Nadehodo and Suzato suddenly see a European man kneeling on top of Asogi's desk and looking at the book on top. This magnificent specimen of a man is Sherlock Holmes. He's eccentric, energetic, follows no common sense, yet at moments is extremely relatable. Turns out, he was the one who discovered that you were in the wardrobe and was the one who put the handcuffs on you. After all, to him it was either that you were the culprit, or the culprit's name was Wardrobe. There was also a bit about Nahodo apparently being the Russian revolutionary Dmitry Demiglaski, so you know Holmes might need a little help. Well, you'll learn how to cooperate with him as the case goes on. I guarantee he'll be your favorite character by the end of the game. Since you're the main suspect, you can't leave the room, but guess who else is here? That's right, baby! It's Hosonaga, back as an undercover sailor! Unfortunately, he was here to be the bodyguard of Asogi, and, well, that didn't go so well. Maybe next time, buddy. As compensation, he offers his help where he can. This results in him leaving to ask the captain about his rights to investigate, giving you a good amount of time to investigate outside the cabin. As you can tell from my commentary thus far, Case 2 has a lot more variance when it comes to the overall tone of the case. 
At the start, your best friend dies and you're suspected by everyone known to believe in you, but I feel like the very existence of Sherlock serves to bring levity to any situation. His eccentricity and sense of humor may be a bit off the wall, but it doesn't feel insulting or that Holmes is intentionally being mean. He just goes to the beat of his own drum, and I think that Case 2 is actually much better because of that. There are a lot of highs and a lot of lows, times for seriousness and times for laughter, even if your best friend was just murdered. As the investigation continues, you find that the next-door neighbor of Asogi was a refugee and famous ballerina named Nikomina Borshevik, and that she may have seen something based on Asogi's last journal entry. You also meet the sailor, Mitrov Stroganov, who is keeping watch on the cabins on the night of the murder. They investigate Nikomina's cabin for a second time when the emergency stop goes off, knocking all the books on the shelf down and the door locks due to the sliding of the bolt. At this point, you start to see the pieces fitting in. Why there were objects thrown all around the room, why the door was shut with no one inside, and how it was possible for someone else to be the killer. This coincidence may be a little bit on the nose in terms of giving information to the player, but that feeling of everything clicking into place at once is also unmatched, so I can't really be too mad. After all, you know how the killer escaped, but you still don't know who did it. Only that it couldn't have been you, Suzuto, or Hosonaga, since none of you know the Russian alphabet. Once the door is unlocked, the sailors attempt to arrest you for trespassing into Nikomina's cabin without her consent, resulting in the men among men Sherlock Holmes coming to your rescue. He deduces that it was in fact Nikomina's pet snake that went to the air vents, leathered down the call bell, and poisoned Asogi by biting him. This is done by training it with a whistle and milk. Unfortunately, not only does the snake not have ears to hear a whistle, but it also can't drink milk, it isn't venomous, and can't slither down a sash either. It was a good theory though. But what I love about this is that this is actually a direct parody of one of Sherlock's cases in which the murder actually happened just like this, clearly poking fun at Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's stories. There's a lot of small details like this which I really enjoy as they enhance the experience for those who are learned in the Sherlock Holmes universe while still serving as comedic for those that don't know about it. This writing is just simply top notch. Nadahuro then takes over Sherlock's theory of logic and reasoning, and it turns out that Nikomina's cat Blackie, or Kodopoi in Japanese, went into the vent and snuck into Asogi's room. Asogi then must have tripped over the cat when it suddenly appeared at his feet, causing him to trip and fall, breaking his neck. It was all just an unfortunate accident. However, things still aren't adding up. After all, who wrote Wardrobe and who caused the emergency stop? While it seems so obvious in hindsight, when you're doing the deductive reasoning, you get so focused on this one thing that you ignore the bigger picture. That may or may not have been intentional, but if it was, I'm extremely impressed since it backhanded me harder than a Russian slapping contest. You end up getting really attached to all these characters over the course of the investigation, and none of them strike you as obviously bad people. That's why it's so easy to dismiss this case as a sad accident and not try to think too hard about it. It's like when you're playing Danganronpa and try not to suspect your favorite characters. Like, no one seems like an obviously bad person, which is why it hurts all the more when you find out that it was that one character you liked all along. Turns out, early that night, the sailors had drugged that night's meal for all the passengers, leading them to fall asleep, and the crew could then stop the ship and pick up Nikomina without them suspecting a thing. Unfortunately, Asogi despises chicken, causing Narahodo to eat his meal while he stayed up that night. When Blackie snuck into the cabin, Nikomina knocked on Asogi's door, leading Asogi to say, What are you doing this late at night, detective? While it was not Hosonaga at the door, Asogi quickly discovered Nikomina's identity due to him having seen one of her performances as a ballerina before, leading him to naturally ask questions. They talked for a bit before Asogi decided to consult Narahodo about what they could do to help her. However, Nikomina thought that he was heading for the call bell in order to tell the captain, so she pushed him away, causing him to trip and fall onto the bedpost, snapping his neck. While the captain was her ally, she was scared since Asogi had mentioned the detective. She was scared that if the detective was notified, she would then be deported to her abusive ballerina troop. After that, she then gained the help of Stroganov, as they were companions on the same ship for many years. They discovered Narahodo in the wardrobe and set up the rest of the scene, cleaning up the evidence and taking an emergency stop in the middle of the night. And that's how everything played out. While the culprit is obvious in hindsight due to the low amount of characters present in the case and how limited the possible culprits could be due to them having to be Russian, it's not something that immediately jumps out at you. While I think it would have been interesting if Hosonaga ended up being the killer, and the whole wardrobe thing dropped, I would have also cried if Hosonaga ended up being the killer, so I'm glad that it wasn't the case. I was pretty impressed by some of the turns that the story took. It wasn't an accident, it was an accident, it wasn't an accident, nope, it was just an accident that was covered up to look like a murder. However, I do have to say that this case didn't really blow me out of the water. It was pretty lukewarm, I'll be honest. Since there wasn't an actual trial or any punishment waiting if you failed, it has a real lack of stakes. I mean, you get deported back to Japan to go back on trial if you didn't prove yourself, but other than that, there isn't much to get you particularly invested in this case. It's just Nadahodo, accused of murder, again. It definitely felt more like a stepping stone for the air cases to shine brighter, as it introduces Holmes, kills off Sogi, and pushes Nadahodo and Suzuto together, and cements them as future business partners. This was basically a setup case for the rest of the plot. 
Speaking of which, there is some nice exposition right in between cases 2 and 3 in which Suzuto gives Narahodo Asogi's katana, and Narahodo then makes up his mind to follow in Asogi's footsteps and see his will to reform Japan's court system through. It was a really touching scene that I was happy to see. Narahodo then makes up his mind to stay diligently for the next 40 days that he would be spending on the ship in order to take Asogi's place as the exchange student. And that is the finale of Case 2. Oh boy, Case 3. Case 3 is truly something special. Here we go. You walk into the office of the Chief Justice to announce your arrival, and the pressure is immense. You're located right at the heart of Big Ben, and you see the enormous gears turning as the clock face ticks in the background. The ceiling stretches up as high as the eye can see as suits of armor and bookshelves line the hall. Now, this is an office. I absolutely love this area, and overall, I just have to say that all of the settings in this game are fucking gorgeous, my god! These first 20 minutes serve to give exposition as to the current political climate of Great Britain and introduce Hart Vortex, the current Chief Justice of Britain. Nadhodo offers to be the substitute exchange student in place of Asogi despite clearly being unqualified, and Vortex then offers to test him in a trial by fire. Saying that's a simple case, he assigns Nadhodo to the defense of Kazuni Magundal, whose trial is right that morning. While it's supposedly a simple case, no lawyers has accepted it, so naturally everything feels a bit odd right from the beginning. This feeling will continue to persist throughout this entire case, that there's something clearly wrong about everything that's going on. Narahodo and Suzuto head to the Old Bailey at the courthouse in order to prove that Narahodo is qualified to take Asogi's place. There you meet Mr. McGundall himself, philanthropist and grand celebrity of London, who has enough wealth to buy the entire city of London three times over. We'll get back to him later. This is when you first hear about the prosecutor of this game, Barack Van Zeeks, known as the Grim Reaper he's come to collect his due. Now, this may be the edgy 13-year-old inside of me talking, but I just think that he's cool. Like, it reminds me of when I was first introduced to prosecutors like Manfred von Karma and Simon Blackwell, prosecutors that you can tell are an actual threat when it comes to their skill. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Gavin, Godo, and Francisca, but they never really got any sort of big foreshadow other than, I'm your mentor's brother, I'm mysterious, and I'm von Karma's daughter. They never really felt like a threat both before and when you're going up against them. They have the drip though, I'll give them that. The trial starts, and you can immediately tell that this is nothing like the Japanese Supreme Court. The gallery is massive, and the jury's bench is right front and center towering over the benches of the defense and prosecution. Above them is the judge and the massive golden scales. Now, this is what a Supreme Court should look like. And here's where we're introduced to the big man himself, Prosecutor Van Zeeks. When you first see him, it feels like you just ran into the final boss of a JRPG when you're only at level 5. He exudes this Victorian vampire energy, and I love it. I'm a sucker for Victorian era fashion and architecture, I will fully admit that. And he's definitely got the strongest fashion sense out of all the prosecutors, but that may just be because he has a cape. I'll get back to you on that one. He holds wine like Godot holds his coffee, but unlike Godot, Van Zeeks is much more classy about it. He never drinks more than a sip of wine, and basically only uses his cup in the same way that Jay Schlatt uses keyboards. <laughs> and while Van Zeeks is rather classy, he isn't afraid to show some snark with his words. He's extremely curt and impatient, and, well, it suits him. It feels like something bad's about to go down if you don't answer him, or if you do anything out of the ordinary. He's also a bit racist, but, uh, that's one fault, I suppose. The initial facts of the case are then lined up. A bricklayer named Thrice Fired Mortar was stabbed with a knife while in a moving omnibus. There were three witnesses, Beppo, the driver, as well as Oscar Fairplay and Adam Ladyfirst, who were riding on top of the omnibus. Inside the omnibus was only the victim and Cosney McGundall. Naturally, this is looking pretty bad for you already. Not only that, M McGundall's gloves were stained with blood, and all three witnesses say that they saw him kill the victim. And just to ram at home, Van Zeeks then presents the knife used to stab the victim, which has an ornate appearance, and the letter M inscribed on the hilt. Unfortunately for Narahodo, it doesn't look like the court will accept that's W for Wumbo instead of M for Magundal. At this point, all the jurors but one think that Magundal killed Mortar. When Van Zeeks asks her why she believes in his innocence, she answers that's because she always goes every day to the nearby park, Magundal Park. Magundal had bought that park for the city and maintains everything as a philanthropist, and therefore she just can't see him as a killer. Van Zeeks then drops the bomb. The only reason Magundal is so wealthy in the first place is because he's the biggest loan shark in London. Not only that, but he presents the court with his ledger book, showing that the victim owed him a sum of 20 guineas, or roughly 21 pounds. Accounting for inflation today, that's roughly 3,600 US dollars. And that's enough for the last juror to vote guilty. At this point, everything looks like it's over, and it's at this point that the closing argument is brought up by Suzuto, which everyone in the courtroom berates her over since it's a practice that's long since died. As someone who didn't know about the closing argument mechanic when I first played this game, I was honestly stunned. 
I just thought the game would take a different direction at that point upon our first loss. It certainly would have been interesting. And I actually kind of regret putting the closing argument in the non-spoiler section, since that reveal was really cool for me as a first-time player, but I still think it was worth it in order to show that there was more variance in gameplay compared to previous entries in the series. Anyway, through the closing argument, you realize that the witness murder is inconsistent, and the amount of money spent to pay the driver would cover one extra person. Van Zeeks then decides he's had enough, and this is when shit gets real. Turns out, none of the witnesses saw the actual moment of the stabbing. The driver Beppo only saw the aftermath after he heard the screams of Mr. Fairplay and Mr. Lady first, and both of them only saw it right after it happened. However, Mr. Fairplay lied about seeing the stabbing since if McGundle was convicted and hanged, the debt he owed to McGundle would therefore vanish. And while I wouldn't say Mr. Lady first lied, he definitely convinced himself that he saw the murder. However, both Fairplay and Lady first insist that they saw a person sitting next to the victim with both hands covered in blood. However, only one of McGundle's gloves has blood on them, therefore it could not have been McGundle sitting with the victim. McGundle is then called to the stand to testify about this mystery third person, and clarifies that there was indeed someone there who he wanted to keep uninvolved, since apparently they had nothing to do with the murder. However, that person is in fact in that very courtroom. At that point, a smoke bomb goes off in the court, forcing an emergency recess. This entire first half of the trial is peak Ace Attorney. You're just thrown in there, trying to figure things out and piece together everything that's going on. The premise for this case is incredibly interesting by having the crime scene be a vehicle rather than your standard room. You can even investigate the omnibus during the trial, which feels like a nice compromise between investigation sequences and trial sequences. Unlike in the first trial, I didn't get bored of these constant cross-examinations because there's a lot more to the evidence that needs to be examined, and the closing argument provides this nice change of pace. All around, it just feels like the natural progression of the Ace Attorney series. I wish that the mainline Ace Attorney games were able to pull something like this off since it feels so seamless. But most of all, it just feels like you're making genuine progress in comparison to the first case of the game, which is most important. The smoke clears, and the girl who was with McGundal on the night of the murder is now in the stand. McGundal explains that the girl, Gina Lestrade, was a pickpocket hiding under his seat in the space where the coachman's gear is supposed to be. Therefore, since she couldn't get out of the box due to him sitting on it, she had nothing to do with the murder. He simply wished that she didn't get involved with the murder since she was young, with a future ahead of her. The jury is swayed towards McGundal with this display, and again that feeling of suspicion you felt since the beginning of the trial seeps in even further. Gina testifies that while she was underneath the seat, she ended up hearing this loud thump, causing her to scream. This caused McGundle to wake up from his nap, where he then saw Mortar on the floor. He sent Mortar up on the opposite seat out of pity before discovering Gina. He sat her next to the body and plied for her to escape. And with this, the jury is convinced, and they all vote not guilty. It's at this moment when... Genius! Van Zeke states that when they investigated the omnibus that morning, all of the coachman's tools were under the seat. Gina couldn't have been hiding under there. At the start of the trial, you could have investigated the omnibus and found the tools under the seat so you would know where the tools were removed during the trial or not. This causes the verdict to shift again to three not guilty and three guilty. Gina then testifies that when the carriage shook, the body fell on her, leading her to get blood on her hands. That's when Mr. Fairplay and Mr. Lady first screamed. In addition, while she was in the seat, she never heard anyone other than McGundle get on or off of the omnibus, which is incredibly strange. Van Zeeks tells the court that the testimony of this pickpocket isn't worth their time, but Nadahoto stops the jurors before they hand down their guilty verdict. Upon further investigation of the omnibus, there's this large bloodstain on the floor and a bloodstain on the skylight. And all that unease you felt throughout the trial now coalesces into this beautiful feeling of dread and anxiety as you start to realize just what's going on. While these bloodstains were easy to miss since they were directly below and above the camera, you can't entirely doubt that they weren't there in the first place. It feels like this game is gaslighting you, and it's honestly one of my favorite parts in the Ace Attorney series as a whole. This entire trial has just been doubt after doubt as contradictions keep popping up and mysteriously getting solved. It feels like everything has come together too nicely. However, you can't be sure if it's you or the game that's making these mistakes. I watched a lot of people play through the game while making this video, and nearly all of them had to go back to their footage to be sure that the bloodstains and the coachman's tools weren't there, and I think that is beautiful writing and game design. Nadahoto feels this unease too, but proceeds anyway, arguing that the body was dropped through the skylight, resulting in the bloodstain on the skylight and on the floor. This would explain the loud thud that Gina and McGundle had heard. Van Zeeks has had enough, clearly stating that this is all a farce. The bloodstains never existed when they investigated the omnibus and accuses Kazumi McGundal of forging evidence. Nadahoto then points out that it was in fact possible for the evidence to have been added during the recess when everyone was forced to escape. At this point, McGundal is furious with all these accusations, with his own barrister not fighting for his verdict, but for the truth. Unfortunately, as long as there is no proof that the bloodstains didn't exist at some point, there is no reason to continue the trial. As a result, the verdict of not guilty is given and uproar ensues in the courtroom as Kazumi McGundal just laughs his heart out. Suzuto congratulates Nadahoto on his win, and McGundal says thanks for giving him a good show. McGundal then stays behind as the Scotland Yards say they still want him to investigate the omnibus with them one last time. 
The chapter then ends with an anime cutscene showing the omnibus in flames and a person trapped inside as Van Zeeks looks on from the background. Now this is how you do a trial. This feels like if you took the final case from Justice for All and case one from Apollo Justice, combined them, and then turned up the dial to an 11 out of a possible 5. From beginning to end, it had the foreshadow, the twists, the turns, memorable witnesses, interesting jurors, the holy shit moments, and the oh fuck, we're in trouble moments. And at the end, to blow it all off, this enormous feeling of dissatisfaction and what the fuck just happened? Just absolutely beautiful. It felt like Shu Takumi had grabbed me by the balls and just wouldn't let go. While this entire case was just a single trial instead of having both a trial and an investigation, it doesn't really feel like it. None of your time is wasted and you feel that constant progression so you never feel like anything dragged or that anything was too repetitive. But when you realize that the progression was a lie all along and that you never actually learned the truth, it's just absolutely astounding. What exactly was the truth? What was all a lie? It feels like the best twist you could have possibly had if you were given that scenario. And then to end it all on that anime cutscene was the cherry on top. Just absolutely splendid. Heart Vortex congratulates Nadahoto on a job well done and accepts him as a bona fide attorney. Congratulations, you get a nice reward of more work! He tells you to talk to Inspector Gregson for the details, and just like Holmes, Gregson is another character from the Sherlock universe, known as the best detective in Scotland Yard. This interpretation of him is definitely interesting compared to the novels, as Gregson definitely seems more human as he just openly complains and talks about the stresses of his job and especially what life has been like since appearing in Holmes' novels. He's constantly eating from his container of fish and chips, and I can't tell if it's because he really likes fish and chips or if it's stress eating. Most likely the latter. My general take on him is that he's too serious for his own good, which is not a bad character to write, and I certainly think that Gregson is a good character, he just doesn't stand out as much compared to the rest of the cast. Anyway, the victim for this case is a woman named Viridian Green, who was stabbed on the side of the road by a passerby and is currently in the hospital. Wow, Takumi, no murder? You shouldn't have! He also reveals that the one who burned to death just last night in the omnibus was, in fact, McGundle. This leads him to talk about the Grim Reaper, Barack Van Zeeks. Turns out, that title isn't because he gets all of his clients guilty. It's because no matter what, after every trial, the defendant always dies. That's why no lawyer bars with the cases that he's prosecuting. After all, no use defending a dead man. But Van Zeeks never kills anyone. All the deaths tend to be in unrelated accidents or incidents only within a few months of the trial. Personally, I find this fascinating compared to previous prosecutors like Von Karma. Like, yeah sure, we've had the standard prosecutors, but I only feel like it's Nayuta and Van Zeeks in which they've clearly got something funky about them that they're not telling you. It's just interesting just to see what they do, I suppose. Naruhodo stews on that for a bit before heading to the jail to meet the defendant. Said defendant introduces himself as Soseki Natsume, another Japanese exchange student, the same as you. He was asked by the Japanese government to go to Britain to stay the English language, but naturally, how the hell does someone do that? Well, funnily enough, Soseki was actually a real person who was told to do exactly this. He later became a famous novelist and was often considered the greatest novelist in modern Japanese history, creating works such as Wagahai Neko Deyaru, Kokoro, Bochan, and leaving behind an unfinished work, Light and Darkness. Hell, he was even on the Japanese 1000 yen note for 20 years. Anyway, as Soseki was walking down the road in the dense fog, he was walking a fair distance behind Miss Green before passing her. It was at this moment where she collapsed with this knife in her back. Assuming she was dead, Soseki ran away back to his flat, dropping his books out of fear. He was later found and arrested by Sherlock Holmes the next morning. Naturally, Nadahoto isn't really having any of this right after the whole McGundle shtick, and to be honest, I wouldn't either. He starts having his doubts about what he should be doing as an attorney and why the hell he's doing all this in the first place. Again, understandable after that whole fiasco. I'm glad the game's actually addressing this instead of just assuming Nadahoto is fine. He got pulled into being a lawyer on a whim and is ending up having to deal with the responsibilities of being one and it isn't always pretty. This is usually the point where the assistant says, believe in your client and everything will turn out okay, but this time it isn't nearly so simple. Nadahoto agrees to investigate the incident, but doesn't promise to take on his defense. He head to the crime scene to meet with Inspector Gregson. Turns out there are in fact two witnesses to the crime, despite the thick fog, with one of them being a constable of Scotland Yard, meaning his testimony should be extremely reliable. There isn't much other information to go on, so Suzuto proposes they go talk to Sherlock Holmes about the arrest of Soseki. They go on over to his house and are approached by a little girl named Iris Watson. Turns out Holmes took her in at some point, but the details are left ambiguous. What's amazing about her though is that she's only 10 years old but already has a medical PhD and was the author of all of Sherlock Holmes' novels. She immediately shows her capabilities by identifying who Nadahoto and Suzuto are with a glance and what they're here for. Iris is essentially the perfected version of Holmes in his deductive reasoning. Sorry, Holmes. I really appreciate her design too, it's like if Steve Bunk met a maid, and yeah, I'm pretty into it, she's adorable. 
Iris tells them that Holmes is off at Soseki's flat and sends him right back off to the crime scene along with a little note for Inspector Gregson with five shillings, or roughly $25 in today's money. No, it isn't bribery, but it turns out that the card was Iris' latest royalty payment to Gregson for using his image in the Sherlock novels, and include a note that says to please help the nice attorney guy. Gregson points you over to Soseki's flat, which was in actuality just on the corner of the crime scene. You first introduce yourselves to the landlord, Mr. Garadam, and his maid, Joan. They say that Soseki only moved in just about a week ago, but always acts incredibly suspicious since he stays up so late and is always alone in his room with mountains of books. But what is most suspicious is Mr. Garadam's room, as there are many things lying about as well as a torn up rug. You go into Soseki's room to find Holmes reading Soseki's books and generally being a nuisance. Also, Soseki is a cat, hell yeah! But it turns out that Holmes didn't arrest Soseki, he was just on orders from the yard to find the man who ran from the scene. He doesn't think Soseki is the culprit either, but he doesn't have much of a choice. However, he does think that Mr. Garadam is hiding something, so Naruhoto decides to stop over before leaving. Along with Mr. Holmes, the both of you deduce that the maid was in actuality Mrs. Garadeb, who lied about her profession in order for them to seem like they have a higher social status, and it is what separates the middle and the lower class. Not only that, but the destruction of the room and the slap mark on Mr. Garadeb indicated there was a lover's quarrel here on the night of the assault, causing a house fire. As a result, Mr. Garadeb lost his book, Adventure of the Lion's Maid. Unfortunately, none of what Mr. Garadeb was hiding was in fact related to Soseki's case. With no more information to gain, Naruhodo, Suzuto, and Holmes head over to the jail to visit Soseki. When he arrives, Naruhodo asks Holmes why he believed in him back on the SSL Claire with Asogi's murder. And Holmes says that it wasn't that he believed in Naruhodo, it was that Holmes believed in himself and his judgment said that Naruhodo wasn't the killer. He believes in what he wants to believe, and that's that. And I actually love this message. Learning to believe in oneself is so obvious in theory, but it's very difficult to do so. Sure, believing in others is important and all, but having the confidence and faith in your own abilities and what you can do with it is a much more powerful message in my opinion. I'm really glad the game decided to go with this rather than the same message that has plagued the series for so long. Yeah, I get it, believe in my client, but believing in myself? I get behind that, self-improvement all the way. With this knowledge in hand, Naruhodo remembers Asogi and what he strived for. Naruhodo then finally accepts Soseki's defense. Overall, this investigation was definitely a bit tame. There weren't many discoveries or any real mystery solved. It didn't even feel like you gained any ammunition for the trial when you found new evidence. It was basically just running around and verifying that the events that Gregson said actually happened. Well, except for the Garadab spat. That was interesting to say the least. The theater of logic and reasoning is still the highlight of these investigations and will never hesitate to make me feel cool and for me to laugh at whatever Holmes comes up with. But that's all there really is to say about this investigation. It's rather lukewarm. Well, at least the trial's a lot better. Inspector Gregson is the first to the stand, and already the list of jurors makes Naruhodo think that the jury system is probably rigged, as you have Oscar Fairplay from Case 3 and Joan Garadeb as jurors for this case. You would think there would be a conflict of interest somewhere, but you know, it, it's fine, it makes things interesting. The inspector testifies that Soseki was heading to his flat after leaving the bookshop The Ragged Reader, and passed by the crime scene on the way there. But thanks to a receipt of the books he bought, Naruhodo proves that Soseki went to Tattered Tales instead, which was on the other side of the block. But that doesn't prove anything, as Soseki could have just pass by the victim as he went home anyway. The jurors then agree to do an any percent speed run of the trial and immediately vote guilty. The closing argument starts, and luckily for you, one of the jurors was a construction worker working on the road between the Ragged Reader and Soseki's house, and another juror was wearing a green coat and fell on the opposite road to Soseki's house. This proves that Soseki could have ran to this gentleman instead of the victim, and naturally this all feels very contrived and unnatural that there were two random jurors that just happened to be at the scene of the crime at the time of the crime. Honestly, I didn't really like this closing argument simply because of it. I mean, it's kinda humorous, and while it does save your ass and get you out of the closing argument, it ultimately amounts to nothing as Van Zeeks just proves that the construction was only two yards long, meaning Soseki could have just jumped over the road. And not only that, but since Soseki's books were left at the scene of the crime, that means that he undoubtedly passed through there. Whoops. Back to square one. The next witnesses are brought out, Patrick O'Malley and his wife Rolla. They're the standard lovey-dovey couple, but since Patrick is a constable that's extremely overworked and constantly falling asleep, it makes for this funny dynamic where Rolla is always talking on behalf of him and yanking on his end of the scarf like a leash, waking him up for a few statements. It's very cute and also kinda scary, I have to admit. Let the man sleep, he literally walks 20 miles a day all while dealing with police investigations. Anyway, they were heading their way to a restaurant for their wedding anniversary upon stumbling upon the crime and saw Soseki fleeing the scene. What was odd, though, is that there were four books at this crime scene instead of three, according to Rolla. When you point this out, Van Zeeks informs you that there were in fact four books, but one of them was in the victim's hand, which was obscured by the camera. I may smell bullshit, but that doesn't change the fact that the victim was holding a book titled The Adventure of the Lion's Mane. Sound familiar? The book is burned as well, which Naruhodo points out to the court, saying that the book belongs to Mr. Garadeb. However, it isn't exactly relevant to the case, so we move on to the second closing argument. 
Through this, we found out that the window of the Garadub's house was open due to the house fire. Not only that, but since Mrs. Garadub was throwing a bunch of objects at Mr. Garadub, the book must have been one of the things that she threw. Nadahodo then proposes that the knife found at the scene could have also been one of the objects that Mrs. Garadub threw, resulting in it ending up in the victim's back. This results in the verdict being overturned, and the trial continues. This pisses Van Zeeks off, since the crime scene was on the other side of the street, and the book reaching that far is incredibly unrealistic, which I completely agree with. However, stranger things have happened, so I think it's interesting that an accident would be considered as a potential angle. But then Pat points out that the window of the Garadub's room was an awning window, meaning that it doesn't open all the way. Therefore, if the knife was thrown out the window, it would have just hit the window and fell to the bottom outside. However, it was a fact that the Adventure of the Lion's Mane ended up on the other side of the street, so it must have gotten there somewhere. At this point, Pat is fully awake and ready to testify, so he offers his input that neither he nor Rola saw a flying book or knife, so it couldn't have happened. As a side note, Narahodo asks him about what it's like being a constable, so Pat shows him his handbook called The Guide to Being a Constable. Narahodo then asks Pat how he knew the Garadub's window was an awning window. Turns out, Pat's beat, or area in the city to patrol, includes the Garadub's house. In fact, that very street is the dividing line of Pat's and the nearby beat. Upon opening the guide to being a constable, Narahodo sees that upon the discovery of a crime, the officers who were in charge of that beat are in charge of the initial investigation. Not only that, but Rolla testifies that she dropped a bouquet at the scene of the crime, prompting Van Zeeks to present it to the court. What's odd, though, is that the bouquet was found on the opposite side of the street. At this point, you can put two and two together. Mrs. Garadab threw the book out of the window in front of the victim, and she picked it up. Right then, the knife fell out of the window and into her back. Soseki saw this and ran away in fear, and Pat and Rolla saw it all go down. If Pat didn't do anything, he would be forced to abandon his anniversary plans with Rolla and stay to help with the initial investigation. After many months of saving up spare change for this one night, it was all going to be dashed to pieces. He just needed one night of peace. At that moment, he told Rolla to head over to the next beat and look for the police box while he guarded the crime scene. Since she was bad with directions, he knew it would take a while for her to get back. While she was doing that, he moved the victim, assuming she was dead, along with the books and the surrounding evidence. Due to the dense fog, he failed to notice the bouquet, resulting in this mess. Pat confesses to all of this and starts to break down. He thought that the victim was already dead and that it wouldn't matter if the crime scene was moved to the other side of the street. If he had bothered to check her pulse, she would have been treated much sooner and most likely wouldn't be in the coma that she is now. I feel like this entire case is saved by this one moment right here. Imagine working every day from sunrise to sundown, and you get this one day off to spend with the most cherished person in your life. Right at that moment, it was going to be taken away, and you wouldn't know when the next opportunity would present itself. It's incredibly human, and to be honest, I probably wouldn't have done the same thing in his situation. It's incredibly bittersweet and incredibly unlucky. That's all this case was. Accidents upon accidents, a Rube Goldberg machine of bad luck. And that's how life is sometimes. Truth is in fact stranger than fiction. Even if this is in fact fiction. So, fiction is stranger than fiction? Well, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that this was beautiful. But we still don't have any conclusive evidence that the knife came from the Garadab's house, or that Mrs. Garadab was the one who threw it. Narahodo asks for Mrs. Garadab to testify, even though she's a juror, and while the court debates over whether a juror should testify, it's ultimately decided as necessary when she admits that there are knives like that lying around the house. Mr. Garadab comes down from the gallery to testify as well, and the cross-examination begins. And oh boy! Mr. Garadab says that while he can't remember what she threw, his pipe was knocked out of his hand by something hard and weighty. Narahodo asks to inspect the pipe and finds a fragment of the knife inside it. Alright, I, I can't defend this anymore, this is dumb. I can believe in the book being thrown out the window, resulting in the victim bending over to pick it up, that's what I would do if a book landed in front of me, and I can believe in the knife plunging into her back because of it, but I can't believe that the knife smacked into his pipe, resulting in the tip of it being embedded perfectly in the tobacco pit for us to pick up, and the trajectory of the knife going completely straight out of the window right after that. This is just way too many coincidences, and I would have preferred it if, say, the tip had broken off upon hitting the window and fell into the Adventure of the Lion's Mane down below, or simply embedding itself in the window. That would logically make much more sense than the tip breaking off and landing in the pipe while the knife maintained the perfect trajectory to embed itself in the victim's back. I know I said that I thought it was neat that this string of accidents happened and I even praised the game for it, but I also think there's a limit to this in order to make it seem slightly reasonable. I would have liked that a whole lot more since there's just a limit to the amount of coincidences that can happen in a row. But that aside, overall this case was rather good. Like, I gave it shit, but there were a lot of redeeming qualities to it. For one, the interactions between Soseki, Holmes, and Narahodo were fascinating and heartfelt. Pat's moving of the crime scene was incredibly emotional and made me tear up. All of the witnesses and jurors were fun and interesting, but 
This case also does have a lot of flaws in that there were too many coincidences when it came to the perfect jurors being selected to tell us about the crime, as well as all the insanity that had to ensue for this case to happen in the first place. While it definitely felt contrived, it more so felt like Takumi created the situation and put the characters through it instead of just writing the crime around the characters. It was natural, yet unnatural, which I know is odd to say, but I definitely think it was interesting. I can't help it but compare it to Case 3 in Justice for All, since that also had a couple of coincidences that resulted in the murder, but I feel like this was way better executed thanks to the much better characters. Turning about Big Top was interesting, but it definitely fell flat because you couldn't stand any of the characters except the killer, and the biggest coincidence of the cape falling on the bust felt even more contrived than the knife shard laying in the pipe. Like, overall, the adventure of the Cloud Kokoro was much better executed, and I I'd give it a solid B. The judge then declares not guilty and ends the trial. Soseki thanks Naruhodo for saving him and for having faith in him, and it's only then that Sherlock arrives to cheer on Naruhodo, fashionably late as always. Soseki gets upset at Sherlock for putting him in the situation in the first place, but Sherlock points out that if Soseki had simply helped the victim, then she wouldn't be in the hospital in the first place. Damn, dude. Soseki acknowledges this and decides that he'll be heading back to the Japanese Empire. However, Naruhodo and Suzuto are low in money due to spending the nights at hotels and don't know where to go. Soseki offers his flat, but Holmes offers to let them move into his place, resulting in Narahoto and Suzuto being able to establish their own office in Holmes and Iris's attic. And so ends case four. It's been a few months since Soseki's trial, and nothing has really happened. There haven't been any new cases, but Suzuto received a telegram that morning and seems to be rather on edge about it. This is basically the nice slice of life section in the story in which you just enjoy a nice breakfast with Suzuto, Holmes, and Iris. Well, try to. You head down and you hear this beautiful music as a sad Holmes plays his violin in the background. I'll admit, it's really funny to watch Holmes complain about how his muse has left him and how he wants to die. A depressing version of the Ace Attorney jingle plays as well whenever he's on screen, which definitely took me off guard the first time I heard it. It's a nice touch. There's some funny dialogue about how Iris made a cat flap maker for Soseki's cat Wagahai, who lives with him now since Soseki couldn't take Wagahai to Japan with him. Anyway, it turns out there was a mix-up with Sherlock's violin at the pawnbroker, so the gang heads over to Hatch's pawn shop to get Holmes' actual violin back. And Hatch himself is rather, uh, eccentric to say the least. He's certainly interesting, but it is entertaining to watch the interactions between Hatch and Holmes as they struggle to clear up the misunderstanding. While you're speaking with him, Hatch says that Holmes actually pledged an unpublished Sherlock Holmes manuscript and created two automatic crime recording devices to protect the valuables he pledges. The devices take a photograph every 30 minutes, and you can already see where this is going. Another customer enters the shop, and they and Hatch are having a go at it over the price of a pledge. Turns out, it's Gina Lestrade, back from McGundle's case. She withdrew a coat that she had pledged earlier and is trying to pledge the music disc that was in its pocket. Naturally, since she's a pickpocket and the code is a bit big on her, Naruhodo suspects that she probably stole the pledge ticket. And at that moment, this dapper specimen calling himself Egg Benedict walks in, claiming that the coat was actually his. Gina gets pissed and assaults him, resulting in him cutting himself on the music disc. Holmes gets in on the action, he and Naruhodo undergo another theater of logic and reason to deduce the true owner of the coat. Turns out the coat wasn't his, and judging by the note that says to McGundle on the music disc, both the coat and the disc were originally McGundle's. But now that McGundle is gone, both Gina and Neg Benedict wish to receive the items that he had left behind. And right after finding that out, Hatch confirms that the coat was dropped off on the night of Thrice Fired Mortar's murder around the time of the crime. We're only around an hour and a half into Case 5, and we're starting to loop back onto the events of Case 3 and the various unanswered questions we've had so far. I was hoping that we would get some more answers regarding Case 3 over the events of Case 4, but unfortunately Case 4 feels rather separated from the overarching plot. But that doesn't matter now. The seeds have already been planted, you can tell that Case 5 is going to be a doozy. Egg Benedict then pulls a gun on Naruhodo and tells him to hand over the music box disc. Hatch threatens to kill himself if Benedict shoots him, which is some sort of defense I guess, but luckily Inspector Gregson shows up with some constables to save Hatch from himself. However, Egg Benedict escapes in the process. Inspector Gregson confiscates McGundle's possessions, as they're apparently evidence to a current case that very well might blow the British Empire wide open. You all head back to Holmes's place, and the topic loops to why Iris and Holmes are living together in the first place. As you suspect, her father was Dr. John H. Watson and Sherlock's partner. He was the one who initially documented all of Holmes's case and kept them in a trunk in the center of the room. Nadohodo realizes just who her father is and opts to end the conversation there. 
Meanwhile, Holmes has made a mold of the music disc that was taken by Inspector Gregson thanks to the use of one of his inventions, but unfortunately it doesn't work with any music box he has on hand. Suzuto then asks about the manuscript that Holmes stored, asking her about the Hound of the Baskervilles. Everything goes quiet, as there is no reason as to why Suzuto should know the full name of the story. Only Holmes, Dr. Watson, and Iris should know it since the story was unpublished. But at that moment, Gina shows up for dinner, so we never get a proper answer to that, which I like to be honest. I love all the questions the case is throwing at us, it keeps me intrigued and I want to actually figure out everything that's going on. You bring back Magundal, and naturally I'm going to think about all the questions I had for that case, as well as bringing in this Egg Benedict, as well as Scotland Yard, and you're just wondering what the hell is up with Magundal. This is really good setup, and I'm glad this is all being acknowledged right at the last case here instead of being pushed to the sequel. Yeah, this quote-unquote investigation is incredibly slow in terms of plot, but you can tell that there are a lot of gears at work here, so I don't mind nearly as much. Plus, it's just nice to have some good-ass character interactions and horsing around. The group retires for the night, but Suzuto tells you that the telegram was in fact a summon by Lord Chief Justice Vortex for tomorrow morning. She doesn't know why, just that she needs to go. Iris walks in with Gina and asks her again about the manuscript. Suzuto says that she can't say why she knows it, and Gina gets caught up to speed on why the manuscript is important in the first place. Gina doesn't believe that Holmes stored it though, believing that he just sold it somewhere, which is why Suzuto knows about it. Considering her upbringing as a street orphan, it makes sense why she would think that way of Holmes. As someone brought up on the street, you really only see the worst sides of people. The thieves, the liars, the cheats, and the criminals. It's not easy to trust someone when brought up with that background, and even more so if that person's being nice to you, as usually that tends to end up with betrayal or them exploiting you for profit. We saw that with how Gundal acted around her during Case 3. Clearly there's something going on behind the scenes that's influencing her, but we don't get to know about it. It's a good character moment. Everyone says goodnight and goes to bed, but Holmes wakes you up in the middle of the night and asks if you see Gina. The two of you look out the window and see that the lights of Hatch's shop are on, and you instantly get this nasty, sinking feeling. Suzuto overhears the conversation, so the three of you all go over to Hatch's shop. You see the shadows of two burglars, and they shoot Holmes before escaping. Holmes yells at you to chase after, so you do, but they're already gone. A constable runs into you, so the two of you run back in. You head to the back where the storeroom is, and you see... Well, that was certainly a way to introduce a case. While it certainly took a while to get going, as this entire section is roughly two and a half hours long, I think that the case is definitely better because of it. You learn more about the characters and the secrets that they've been hiding, as well as learn more about who they are as people. It sets some stuff up that clearly won't be solved until the sequel, but personally I'm fine with that. It gets your mind racing wondering just where the hell this is going to go, which is the best part of mystery games. They set the breadcrumb trails and force you to theorize and try to piece together what's going on even before the characters try to tell you. Ultimately though, most of your theories end up being wrong, but you're always happy to be proven wrong later down the line. That's a detail I loved about Ace Attorney Investigations 2, and it's certainly back in full force here. The morning after, Naruhodo is back at Holmes' place with Iris and brings her and the audience up to speed. Holmes is being treated at the hospital, and Gina was arrested as she and Hatch were locked alone in the room together, with the gun in her hand. Naruhodo decides to investigate, bringing Iris along despite the risks and her age. Suck on that Konami Date, Naruhodo is cooler than you'll ever be. At this point, you're given free reign over where you can investigate next, which is a first for the game since cases 1 and 3 were all trials, and cases 2 and 4 were completely linear due to a lack of locations to explore. But now you can go to the hospital, the jail, Hatch's pawn shop, Holmes' house, and Baker Street. It's nice to have a little bit of breathing room to go towards whatever mystery is tickling your brain at the moment. You want testimony? Go to Gina. You want evidence? Go to the crime scene. You want extra fluff dialogue and humor? Investigate the objects around the office and Holmes' house. Just having options for once is nice. Let's start with Gina then. Naruhodo asks about why she went to the pawn shop and what happened, but Gina simply blows you off. She says she refused the government appointed attorney and refused to talk. Even when he offered to defend her, she just blows you off too and says that all the adults are just liars that'll pull you off the ladder just to climb up further. But not only that, but that she's the biggest liar of them all. She doesn't elaborate, but she does give you a single photograph saying that it was inside one of McGundle's coat pockets. On the opposite side, it turns out to be a pledge ticket for a small box that McGundal deposited two days before Mortar's murder. But that's all Gina has to tell. Over at the pawn shop, Gregson's at the scene, you immediately notice a difference in how he treats Iris in comparison to you. Luckily, he isn't a lollicon, thank god, as he actually has a pretty good reason for it. Immediately after being praised as the Yard's greatest asset in the Sherlock Holmes novels, his salary doubled. 
That's how big the story's influence is. Because of this, if Iris happened to write a single bad word about him, his salary would most likely plummet. He talks about the sleepless nights he has as a result of this, and his paranoia about what Iris think about him is at an all-time high due to being famous. He fears everyone else would see him as having a big head and being too proud for an inspector. And honestly, holy shit is that understandable. While I certainly can't speak from experience, I can only imagine the amount of pressure that he would have to endure considering everyone in town now knows his name. Even the most famous celebrities tend not to be recognized in public that often, considering their fans are all over the globe, but for Gregson, nearly everyone in London reads the Sherlock Holmes novels, which of course would create a large amount of concern for him. This really gave me a lot of appreciation for Gregson as a character. There's nothing much else you can do here due to not having a letter of request from the defendant, so you decide to pick Suzuto up from her summons by Chief Justice Vortex. It seems that Suzuto's father has fallen ill and she's required to return to Japan tomorrow morning before Gina's trial to ensure that she sees him before he passes. It seems you'll be doing things on your own tomorrow. Lord Vortex states that the Yard shouldn't be wasting time on this case as they have more important matters to deal with, likely the same ones that Gregson was talking about the day before. But there's no more information to be gained here, so let's visit Holmes. Or not. He isn't anywhere to be seen. The constable informs you that the surgery isn't going well as now the anesthetics are working, with Holmes muttering that he shouldn't have drank so much coffee last night. Which makes sense if you think about why Holmes was up that late at night in the first place. Suzuto asks that they see Gina again so they can see her one last time before she heads to Japan. Upon arriving, she says her goodbyes and asks that Gina prove that she lied as a final request. Naruhoto concludes that it must have been about the trial of Cosme Magundal in which she was brought up onto the stand. Gina confirms this and she starts elaborating on the truth of the case. She was hiding under the seat, that was true, and she initially heard both Magundal and Mortar get onto the omnibus together. They were both whispering to each other during the whole carriage ride so she couldn't hear them, but she could definitely tell that they knew each other. She then heard this loud thud causing her to scream. She was subsequently discovered by McGundle, who then threatened her, saying that she couldn't testify about the truth of what happened or else he would make it so she had no home to go back to, as well as the orphans of the East End. In the army bus, she saw a music box disc, which McGundle then stuffed into his coat. When the carriage stopped, McGundle bribed the driver Beppo into pledging his coat over at the pawnbrokers while the two witnesses called the police. Gina was then released upon two conditions. One, that she never say anything regarding the murder, and two, to hold on to the pledge ticket for the coat. McGundle then gave her precise instructions on what to say and what not to say in court should the police come for her. And that's everything that Gina knows. At this point, it seems very likely that McGundle was the true killer of thrice-fired mortar. It feels like you're getting not only one step closer to discovering the truth, but actually five steps. Narahodo then asks again for a letter of request, asking if not for her sake, then for Holmes' sake as the one who was shot. And with this, you can now investigate the scene. When you get there, you find the pledge ticket Gina had for the coat, along with a fingerprint of blood on it. You also learn about stereoscopes, which in the 3DS version are used to make differences between two images pop out. It's basically a way to cheat those spot the difference puzzles. It's a neat mechanic, I'll admit, and I learned something too, but for those of you on the Android version, I am so sorry! There was also a bullet found in the calendar, along with the bloodstain. Iris then pulls out Holmes' latest invention, a smoke launcher that changes the color of blood depending on its type. This can be used to identify who the blood came from. The blood on the calendar turns green, and Nadahoto proposes that they use it on the bloodstain on the pledge, which turns purple. Since the bloodstain on the pledge was most likely from McGundle's gloves, the purple blood belongs to Mortar. In the storage vault, Iris uses her gun on Hatch's bloodstains, which turn blue. The manuscript for the Hound of the Baskervilles is also intact, and the gun that Gina was holding belonged to Hatch and only had a single bullet in it. However, they couldn't find the small box that McGundle had left behind. After looking at the day of the pledge, Inspector Gregson deduces that it must have been taken from the storeroom and put on the shelf for revoked pledges. Unfortunately, there's nothing left to find, so Narahoto and co. head back over to Gina to report their progress. Gina confirms that the real reason she went to the pawn shop was to check for the manuscript and see if it was there. Turns out she's a softie after all. But Narahoto then notices some bloodstains on the sleeves of the coat that she was wearing. McGundle's coat. They were simply hard to spot since the coat was so dark. Iris fires her smoke launcher at the coat and large purple spots appear. Way too many for simply being a bystander. With this, it's confirmed. That night in the omnibus, McGundle stabbed Mortar with a knife and fabricated the entire trial from the testimony to the evidence in order to get off the hook. And this fucking eats at Nautohoto. I mean, what should you do after finding out that you were just defending a cold-blooded killer this whole time? What do you do after you secure the innocence of a murderer using false evidence and testimony? Should you really believe in your client 100% of the time? Suzuto and Nautohoto talk later that night about what they've learned while in court, and Nautohoto seems to have come up with an answer. He says that people have many different sides to them, but you can only see one part and you have to make your judgments based on that. While you may not be able to see everything, it's important that we keep moving forward nonetheless. This is also a fantastic message. People are the worst, that's a fact, but people also have the potential to be lifelong friends that can change your life for the better. 
Learning how to properly trust someone and understand who is worth putting your trust in is something that everyone struggles to come to grips with, especially me. What is important is learning how to keep this in perspective and acknowledge that no matter how many bad people there are, there are always a few good eggs. It may take you years to find them, and some may come and go at the flip of a coin, but they are out there. You just have to keep searching. And that's the end of the investigation. Holy shit that was long. More shit happens in this segment than the entirety of cases 1 and 2. It definitely felt like it overstayed its welcome at points, but overall it felt like you got what should have been the investigation of case 3 and the investigation of case 5 all rolled into one. And while you may know the truth of case 3 now, it definitely feels like there's still some in-between events that you don't know about, as well as the fact that you still don't have any information about what truly really happened in case 5. The characterization was nuts, especially with Gina and discovering who she is and why she did what she did. I wish that cases 2 and 4 did something like this with its characters, but I am a little bit let down by how little was discovered about Hatch's murder. It felt a lot more like a lore dump on case 3 as well as foreshadow for the next game rather than a standout case on its own. If the story of case 3 wasn't there, would the investigation have held up or been nearly as interesting? I don't particularly think so. It was more like it was riding the coattails of case 3 rather than trying to be something on its own, which is a real shame. But does that mean it's bad for relying on Case 3 as a structure? I'm not entirely sure. Would Case 3 have been worse off if you had actually discovered the truth? Yes, it would have. Therefore, I can accept Case 3 being merged in with Case 5 here, even if it doesn't completely stand on its own. It's a symbiotic relationship, I suppose. Before the trial formally starts, Iris gives you a newspaper about Gina's case, but on the backside, it talks about how top secret communications were intercepted and given to an enemy nation. Huh. The judge then asks a simple question to Van Zeeks. Why had he returned to being a prosecutor after five years of absence for a simple robbery and murder case? He only used to prosecute only the most important trials within the political and economic spheres. Van Zeeks answers it's because he hates two kinds of people, those who uses their riches to feign altruism, and Japanese. First off, rude, and racist, and second off, what's his deal? Well, that's a problem that'll be solved in the sequel, I suppose. At least now we know why he's prosecuting all the trials that Naoto Hodo is defending. Simply because he has a thing against Japanese people. Like, come on, man. The jurors are then introduced, who among them are John Garadeb, the old grandpa juror from Case 4, the maiden typewriting jurors from Case 3, and fucking Dmitry Demiglaskiu, the Russian revolutionary from the article in Case 2. It's a very small world, after all. Look, I'm happy to see him all again, but I also feel like it would've been nice for the asset creators and Takumi to make at least two more of the jurors unique. Like, I get that it was needed to save time, and this is acknowledged even in the writing, but it would've been appreciated. Van Zeeks gives a brief summary along with the autopsy report, and he decides that it's time to go to work. He calls three witnesses to the stand, the burglars who were there at the crime scene and shot Mr. Holmes, and Inspector Gregson. And they are hilarious, to say the least. Nemi and Tully Tinpillar, your typical small-time criminals that you would see as like the new guys in a mobster film. They constantly balance jokes off of each other and try to frame Inspector Gregson as the secret third brother Wally. They also look suspiciously like Mario and Luigi, so there's that too. They add a lot of much-needed levity to the situation, they have never failed to make me laugh. Like, I love these little guys! Van Zeke says that they witnessed the crime when they attempted to rob the shop, but weren't the killers themselves. However, they did shoot Mr. Holmes which is unforgivable, and this is proved by their gun, which had only one bullet fired when they were discovered. Therefore, they couldn't have shot Hatch. He then brings out the automatic crime recording device, and unfortunately for you, one of the pictures shows Gina holding a gun and threatening Hatch. Oops. With this, the jury votes guilty and the first closing argument starts. Through it, you find out that the tin pillars actually move some things in the counter very slightly through the use of stereoscopic vision. By crossing your eyes while looking at the same two photos, the differences between the objects pop out of the photo in 3D due to how our brain processes images. It's a fun gimmick that's used a couple of times throughout the case, and it doesn't overstay its welcome, thank god. It hurts to cross my eyes for that long. Since this is something that the tin pillars didn't mention, it's important to hear further testimony, so the trial continues. They testify that they were startled by the gunshot and hit the desk, moving some of the items. But just before the gunshot, they heard Hatch yell, Hand over that gun! with some included theatrics. However, if that was the case, Hatch couldn't have been shot in the back. But then they say that they saw Hatch holding the gun, which is strange since they didn't see what they were doing in the storeroom. It's all just shitty lies on top of more lies, and while it is entertaining, it's also a little bit frustrating. It's not that bad, but it's just a bit tiring at this point. They then adjust their testimony and say that when they entered the shop, Hatch leapt at Tully and threw him right onto the counter. When Nemi pulled his gun on Hatch, Hatch ran into the storeroom. The Tin Pillars then fled the scene. Nadahoto points out that they could have shot Hatch when he ran into the storeroom, but Van Zeeks points out that then the amount of bullets shot wouldn't add up. 
After all, the Tin Pillars only shot one bullet, which was used on Holmes. Van Zeeks then asserts his victory by proving that he's the best bottle flipping champion, just despite you. Clearly, he was over a century ahead of his time. Then, just to show Gina's poor character, he then talks about her attempted fraud with McGundle's disc, but Inspector Gregson begs that the disc not be submitted to the court as evidence. Van Zeeks disregards him and submits it anyway, sufficiently proving that Gina had the motive, capability, and opportunity for the murder in one fell swoop. And so begins the second closing argument. You question the old man and find out that he's actually Sherlock's surgeon, but the bullet completely disappeared from his abdomen, nowhere to be seen. Again, small world. Lots of conveniences, but at this point I just have to put it aside. It's not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things and doesn't really detract from my enjoyment of the case. Anywho, the issue is that Sherlock didn't have an exit wound on his back, so the bullet must have still been inside him. But if the bullet on the calendar wasn't the one shot at Sherlock, then who was it? You inspect the disc with Benedict's blood on it to find that it turns green. This means that the blood in the calendar was also Benedict's, meaning that he was at the shop on the night of the murder. Yet the surgeon didn't find the bullet inside Sherlock. As for how Sherlock got injured without being shot, Iris says that Holmes had a pouch of dangerous chemicals on his hip where he was shot. The bullet must have hit the chemicals and exploded. Upon getting and examining his pouch, you find the third bullet. But since both guns at the scene only fired one bullet, that means that there must have been another person with a gun at the scene of the crime, Egg Benedict. But this presents a problem. None of Holmes' inventions have been officially approved by the state, and we don't know that the color of one's blood is exclusive to a single person. There's just no reason to accept it as evidence. However, since the closing argument is up to the jurors on whether to continue or not, it doesn't matter whether the evidence is valid as long as the jury believes in Mr. Holmes. They vote to continue, but since no one knows who Egg Benedict is, the trial comes to a standstill. Luckily, the fifth juror recognizes him as her co-worker at the same office, so the trial takes a recess in order to summon him. Oh boy. Let it go, Lumi. Let, let the plot do its thing. It's okay. It's contrived, but it's okay. Whew. During the recess, Gina elaborates on what happened. She broke into the pawn shop to check on the manuscript when Hatch popped out of the storeroom. Out of fear, she swiped the gun from the table and threatened him into showing it to her. He agreed, but only if she put the gun down. They went to the storeroom and then heard the tin pillars breaking in. Hatch takes the gun and goes out to check. Gina heard a scuffle and two simultaneous gunshots. Hatch then fell into the door, where Gina then locked it. Gina took the gun from his corpse for self-defense, but realized he was dead. She fainted upon this realization. The rest plays out as you already know. I really like this flashback. You get to see Hatch one last time and you realize just how kind of a man he was. He insisted on being the one to leave the storeroom and facing the intruders, even shooting one of them, all to protect Gina. It really makes you feel for Hatch and pulls on the heartstrings a little bit. He was a good guy, just unlucky enough to have his shop broken into, twice, on the same night. Hell, if McGundle chose any other pawn shop, then he wouldn't have been in this situation at all. There haven't been many cases in Ace Attorney in which you get to know the victim before the murder. The only ones I can think of are Case 2 in Ace Attorney 2, Case 5 in Ace Attorney 3, and Case 5 in Ace Attorney 6. And I'm happy to see just how nicely it was executed. You didn't expect Hatch to die, he was simply just a fun side character. You were expecting to be summoned by a Vortex for the next case, not have it literally on the building across the street. It was unexpected, and it was heartfelt. His life was gone, just like that. Gina asks why Naruhoto continues to believe in her, to which he responds about his own case back in Japan. He says that even though he was suspected, Asogi was always there to stand by him. Naruhoto initially doubted him, thinking that even Asogi must have suspected him. But Asogi never gave up, he never surrendered, and continued to believe in his best friend until the end. And Naruhoto returned that trust, he just wants to pay that forward. He recognizes that Gina is different from a Gundle and is a person worthy of his trust. With that, he tells her not to worry, everything is okay now. A more emotional version of Asogi's theme plays in the background as Naruhoto remembers everything that led him to this point, and I'll be honest, I was in fucking tears, man. To see Naruhoto's journey all the way from case one, where he doubts himself and everyone else around him, to today, with his overflowing confidence and resolve, is simply beautiful. He knows how Gina feels better than anyone else and knew exactly what to say. Now, I see Asogi within Naruhoto. Again, I reiterate that the characters in this game are the best out of the entire series. I don't feel like I've cared about the characters of an Ace Attorney game this much before, despite having played the entire series. I feel like I care more about Naruhoto and his friends than anyone else in the mainline games, and I've had 9 games in total to understand the main cast. It's just that the writing in this game is just far superior, that's all there is to it. The court reconvenes, but Benedict still hasn't arrived yet due to the rain. 
The judge repeats that the use of Sherlock Holmes' chemicals lacks scientific basis and will not be admitted into evidence. Bandic then arrives on the scene and introduces himself formally as Rupert Crogray, telecommunications expert. He testifies that he wasn't there on the night of the crime, but Nemi accidentally slips that he was worried about him reopening the wound on his arm. Great company you have there, Crogray. Nodohoto then points out that if he never visited the pawn shop, then there shouldn't be a cut on his thumb due to the music disc. Crogray testifies that he was in fact there, but the disc still belonged to him. Nodohoto then asks Inspector Gregson about the disc, to which Gregson refuses to respond. Van Zeeks then deduces that since he can't talk about it, it must be a direct order from Lord Chief Justice Vortex himself. Nodohoto then proposes that Krogray broke into the shop to get the small box Magunda left behind. But unfortunately, nothing was stolen from the scene since the automatic crime recording device shows no differences between the before and after of the unredeemed pledges. However, thanks to stereoscopic technology, it turns out that one small box actually moved on the night of the murder. While the bailiff leaves to retrieve it, Van Zeeks asks what the point of stealing the contents of the box would be, as it isn't valuable in the slightest. They shouldn't be related to the crime. Nodhoto understands that the only way to prove their significance is to have Gina testify. Unfortunately, this was to result in his reputation and Gina's being dragged through the mud, with Gina possibly being arrested again for perjury. It's all up to Gina where she believes she's ready to testify or not. What will she choose? Will she trust Nodhoto? She initially turns him down, but Iris tags in and asks her to trust him. She testifies about the truth, shocking the court and causing the defense to be heckled and jeered at. Nodohoto continues the cross-examination and sees Krogray and Gregson having a secret discussion. They seem to be negotiating. At this point, the bailiff returns with the small box. It turns out that it was actually a music box made to play McGundle's disc. Upon trying to play it, Gregson begs with the court not to. But neither Nodohoto nor Van Zeeks really care, so the box plays, and it's just the simple offbeat tune of the same note playing over and over. Krogray laughs, saying that the music box must be broken. Nodohoto then deduces that the music box must not be playing music at all, but something else entirely. Iris analyzes the box and discovers that it was only meant to play one note to begin with. It's not broken. It's Morse code. Nodohoto then pulls out the morning's newspaper and asserts that on the disc is Morse code containing the leaked information from the government. Krogray and McGundle had attempted to commit treason and sell government secrets, which is punishable by death. Krogray had to get the disc back from the pawn shop at all costs or he would be hanged. Right then, Nemi and Tully Tinpillar burst onto the stand and yell if they knew he was selling state secrets, they wouldn't have fucking helped him. They confess that they followed Krogray's plans to break into the pawn shop and intend on taking him down with them. However, Krogray insists that he was never at the scene. Not only that, but that the music box isn't even playing Morse code. After all, it's only playing one note for a fraction of a second, while Morse code is made up of two types of sounds. Upon investigating the music box, you discover that there's actually a music box on the opposite side where you can put a second disc. But unfortunately, you don't have a second disc to play with. Not only that, but it was Mortar who was negotiating with Magundal, not Krogray, so he shouldn't have anything to do with it even if the music box was actually used to hold a telegram. Nodohoto then asks the Tin Pillars how they know Krogray, and it turns out that they're childhood friends. In fact, Rupert Krogray used to be called Rupert Milverton back then. Turns out, Mortar's last name was also Milverton. Nodohoto then asserts that Mortar was put up to the negotiations with Magundal by his son, Rupert Krogray. The both of them concocted the plan to steal state secrets and sell them to Cosney Magundal. The decision to encode into the music box was most likely as a precaution in case negotiations fell through. However, Mortar ended up being killed by McGundle, resulting in Crow Grey needing to cover up his tracks and recovering the pledges that McGundle had made. He broke into the pawn shop with the tin pillars and recovered the music disc inside the box before leaving the scene. Crow Grey denies this, but you can see blood seeping through his sleeve. Hatchet fired a bullet at the same time as Crow Grey, resulting in one hitting Crow Grey's arm and the other embedding itself in Hatch's back as he tried to flee. Crow Grey then confesses that he was at the scene, but continues to deny shooting Hatch and selling state secrets. He then testifies that he couldn't have done it since apparently he saw the moment that Gina shot Hatch. Hatch first shot Krogray before running into the storeroom. Krogray then peered into the storeroom through the peephole and saw Gina shoot Hatch. To serve as evidence, he tells the court that there's blood on Gina's coat. Although we know that the blood in the coat belongs to Mortar, it won't be accepted as evidence and therefore looks really fucking bad for Gina. Van Zeke sends the coat to be tested for blood and the cross-examination continues. Krogray testifies that Gina had a third gun on her and disposed of it by tossing through the peephole. Krogray then took it for self-defense and left the scene. Obviously, this makes no sense for Gina to do, as she should have just tossed out both guns, but you don't have the evidence to disprove it. During this, Inspector Gregson and Nemi seem to be having a scuffle over why the Tin Pillars never knew about the third gun, which is certainly out of character for Inspector Gregson. The results of the blood test then return, and things are only heading down from here. 
Naruto insists that the blood belongs to Mortar, but since the official verdict for Magundal's case labeled him innocent, then according to the law, the blood in the coat can't belong to Mortar. There's no way to definitively say that the blood belongs to Mortar, so the court rules guilty. Naruto falls apart, thinking that there's no way he can convince the jurors for a third time with such a lack of evidence. At this point, the bailiff who brought the evidence says, A man who can't trust his fellows is a sad sight indeed, wouldn't you agree, my dear attorney? He takes off his helmet to reveal that Holmes was the bailiff the entire time! While normally I would call shenanigans, I can fully see Mr. Holmes pulling the stunt just for the thrill of it. He'd totally do this. He gives you what looks to be a bento from Suzuto, but upon opening it, it turns out to be the cap flat maker that Iris had the night of the murder, along with the words that Suzuto was a failure of a legal assistant. On the night Gina had stayed over, she taught them pickpocketing tricks, resulting in Suzuto stealing this from Iris. She had accidentally taken it with her on the night of the crime. While it may be the closing argument, technically, the cross-examination was suspended in order for the coat to be presented to the court. Therefore, Naruto still has the right to continue Krogray's cross-examination. Naruto then presents the cat flap maker, showing that the peephole on the door was not a peephole at all, but a cat flap made by Suzuto. Therefore, since the peephole didn't exist for Krogray to witness the crime through, his testimony is all bogus. I'll admit, this part is a little bit asinine. It's too convenient that the cat flap maker even existed as a plot point instead of a short gag, and the fact that Suzuto had it on her makes it even more so. But again, it's something relatively minor, so I can forgive it. Kind of. It's a rather large plot point, but since there's been so many MacGuffins throughout the game, I just won't bother anymore. But Van Zeeks then points out that Naruto still hasn't proved when the cat flap was created. Luckily for you, you still have that picture of before the crime thanks to Holmes' camera. While you successfully proved that Crow Gray was lying, you still haven't yet definitively proven that Crow Gray shot Hatch. At this point, it feels like trying to shoot a minnow in the ocean. It's reminding me of Case 1 again, especially with how long the trial has gone on, and not in a good way. Naruto then asks a simple question. If the people didn't exist when Krogray was at the scene, then how did Krogray know that a people had existed at all? Someone must have fed him that information. Looking back at the trial until now, there was only one person that could have told him, Inspector Tobias Gregson. Krogray must have struck a deal with him in order to gain that information, and what else does he have to offer the Inspector but the second disc? But since he can't trust Krogray, he must have physically received the disc from him. Naruto asks that Inspector Gregson be searched, but for some reason, Gregson consents to it. The judge tells Naruto that if he's wrong, it'll be seen as an insult to Scotland Yard and the British Empire, resulting in his suitability as an attorney being called into question. First of all, screw off man, that's a little bit of a stretch. Naruto realizes that Gregson must have pawned it off onto someone else in case he was searched, so instead, Naruto asks that only one other witness be searched, Nemi Tinpillar. After all, it was unusually out of character for Gregson to have threatened him with physical violence early in the trial. Therefore, it must have been a ruse for him to plant the disc on his person as a failsafe. I have to say, I'm extremely impressed with how all the events in this case fit together. It feels like you have to remember everything as every event is significant in some way. That's probably why the script for Case 5 here is 11 pages long. Everything is connected, and that's something I absolutely love, and it's why I also really enjoy Ace Attorney Investigations too. As expected, the music box disc is found in his jacket pocket. But yet again, this doesn't prove anything, just that the disc was inside an Emmy Tinpillar's pocket. There are two conditions to winning now, either force Inspector Gregson to confess to making a deal, or force Rupert Krogray into admitting the murder. Naruto decides to play the music box with both discs in it in order to force the Inspector into admitting he made a deal. And maybe blackmail, but... no, no, it's just blackmail. Gregson shouts that he'll be making an enemy of the government, but Naruto in his badassery yells that he's prepared to make any enemies he has to in order to protect his client. What a guy. I'm so proud. Asogi, look at how our baby boy has grown up! While the music box plays, Inspector Gregson admits to making the deal and yells to turn it off. Turns out, if he didn't take the deal, Krogray would have leaked the information to the world, forcing his hand. He told Krogray about the people and the blood in the coat. While I understand the people, how the hell did Gregson even know about the blood in the coat? Not even Gina knew about that and she was the one wearing the damn thing. I call shenanigans. Krogray screams, breaking his cane over the witness stand and starts fucking strangling Inspector Gregson like Jesus Christ man, I get it, but chill. Well, I can understand that too, as if I was sold out and would be hanged to death as a result, I might have been a tad furious as well. After the bailiff saves Gregson, Krogray gives his reasons for the crime. As he grew up poor in a house where his parents only argued, he suffered alone. He had resolved to study hard and escape from that life. He became a telegraphist. Seeing this, McGundal offered him a chance. In exchange for intercepting the telegrams, McGundal would give him enough money so he would never have to dream about waking up in the slums again. He took all the precautions he could, even putting the telegrams into a custom-made music box. He had asked his father Mortar to make the music box, as he was once an apprentice music box maker. The transaction was to be split into two, at first just the first disc and music box for 10 guineas, and the second disc for 1,000 guineas. They did this trade once before. 
After the first trade, Crowgrave gave his father 200 guineas as a sign of appreciation, but Mortar was sharp. He asked that he help make the second trade, but it seems that on this trade, McGundle became uneasy about the second transaction. That would result in the omnibus murder. At that moment, Crowgrave swore to take revenge. He used the money gained from his trades with McGundle to hire the bailiffs in the third trial. He was the one who poured kerosene on the omnibus, and he is the one who caused the arson and McGundle's resulting death. Everything is connected. But he wasn't done there. He remembered something McGundle had told him regarding pawn shops. Until that point, McGundle had paid him by storing objects that could be sold at the pawnbrokers for him to pick up. Therefore, if McGundle had hit the disc from the omnibus at the spur of the moment, it would be there. Recognizing that Gina must have been threatened due to her lies in the court, he suspected that she probably had the pledge ticket. He performed a background check on her and followed her into the shop on the last day of the pledge. Unfortunately for him, Gregson was there to take the disc from him. Thinking that the music box and last disc must be there, Crowgray conspired to steal the box before the police found it. Upon breaking in, he found the box on the shelf and put the disc in his pocket. That moment, Hatch burst through the storeroom door and shot Crowgray in the arm. Out of reflex, Crowgray shot at Hatch using the pistol in his opposite arm, resulting in the murder. He didn't intend on killing him, but his aim was too good for his own good. And that was everything that had happened at the pawnbrokers that night. Holy shit. Case 5 was absolutely nuts and is by far my favorite trial in any Ace Attorney game. From beginning to end, it knew what it wanted to do, how it wanted to do it, and when to properly end it. There were some bumps along the way, as it definitely felt drawn out, but everything was purposeful. That is the aspect of a great story, when you can tell that the writer had thought of everything out since the very beginning. It's why I love stories such as ReZero, Attack on Titan, and Ace Attorney Investigations 2. Takumi had a vision, and he went for it. Every single character had their moment in the spotlight, and none of their decisions felt forced or out of character. This case felt incredibly... human. It was motivated by fears, anxieties, and greed, but worst of all, good intentions. Krogray simply just didn't want to be in the slums again. He cared for his father, wishing him no harm, but by bringing him into his sins, he lost his life. He enlisted the help of his childhood friends and only pulled them into his sins as well. Due to a single deal with the devil, he lost everything and his life collapsed around him. He didn't even get to keep his riches since he spent it all on killing the Gundal. Contrast this with Gina, the girl who had nothing, just like him, but instead chose to trust in those around her and believe in herself. It's a fascinating dichotomy and something I truly have to give a standing ovation for. The characters in general were something to be applauded. To see Naruhoto's growth as you proceeded, seeing his past self in Gina and being her Asogi is something that will stay with me for many years to come. Naruhoto yelling to the world that he will protect Gina at all costs made me cry tears of joy. He's everything that Asogi had hoped for, and more. Iris contributed during the trial multiple times when he didn't know what to do, all for the sake of Gina, and even Holmes, who was still recovering from surgery and about to keel over, took the time to deliver critical evidence to you and give Suzudo's departing words. You've really made some great friends. The trial was long, it was difficult, and it was exhausting, but it was the perfect bow on this gift box to you, the player. With this, the court declares a verdict of not guilty, but it seems Gina will still be staying behind due to her crimes of perjury, breaking and entering, and attempted fraud. Van Zeeks then asks what Naruhoto is going to do about the fact that he played a classified telegram for the court, but the fifth juror informs him that it wasn't even Morse code being played by the music box. Just what the hell is on it then? The court adjourns, and only Naruhoto and Van Zeeks are left in the courtroom. Van Zeeks compliments Naruhoto on his efforts. He admits that the only reason he returned was to cross blades with you, as he was forced to remember the Japanese man who portrayed his trust many years ago. Van Zeeks didn't understand which part of the man was the true him, so he hoped to find that answer through you. Naruhoto then asks what happened, only for Van Zeeks to answer that he will learn eventually. Gina and Naruhoto catch up in the lobby, with them both telling each other thanks for trusting them. Naruhoto again remembers Asogi's words, thinking that he finally understands what he meant and hoping he's the attorney Asogi hoped he'd be. Don't worry, man. You definitely are. While well, he reminisces when the bailiffs ask them how long they're going to pretend he isn't here, and turns out it's Holmes again! <laughs> he gives his heartfelt, well, as heartfelt as you can get from Holmes, congratulations. Iris arrives as well, and Gina swears that she's going to live an honest life from now on and make it so that all the East End children can live normal lives. The prison carriage arrives for her, and Chiyo gives Naruhoto a full-on thank you, crying tears of joy. I'm... I'm not crying. You're crying. This game doesn't make me feel emotions at all. Not even when I see this adorable display. <laughs> and off she goes. <laughs> Iris then informs you that due to the rain, the ships of the port were all delayed by at least half a day. With Sherlock's connections, and definitely not blackmail, you're able to catch a train that barely gives you enough time to see Suzuto off. You catch her just as she's about to throw a book on the British Code of Law into the ocean. She says that she shouldn't have anything to do with the law due to her conduct at the crime scene involving the people. 
but it did do its work as a proper trap for the culprit, while at the same time verifying Gina's safety. And it would have only worked if she had kept it a secret, otherwise the culprit would have known that the people wasn't a viable option. And if Narahoro was informed, he would have been deemed an accomplice to her crime and promptly dismissed. I'm glad that the staff at least tried to explain it, but it still all seems a little too convenient to me. Suzuto still feels guilty over having committed the crime, but Narahoro assures her that it was the right thing to do as it saved Gina's life. She's nothing like Kroge or Magundal, and Suzuto expresses her thanks. After this moment, Narahoro reminds us that there are still remaining mysteries. For example, the music box. Holmes assumes that it must have been encrypted and that someone with enough time on their hands will eventually figure it out. And speak of the devil, Iris then mutters something. A. S. O. U. G. I. Narahoro, as well as myself, are flabbergasted. Not only did she decrypt it, but she remembered all the dots and dashes played by the music box. She's a scary kid. Turns out, it isn't even encrypted, it isn't even Morse code. It's the Japanese equivalent of the Morse code, Iroha code. Suzuto then translates the rest of it. K. Asogi, A. Sashin, T. Gregson, J. Watson. The above four. Naruhoto decides that he and Suzuto should continue to keep Watson's death a secret from Holmes and Iris. But it's time for Suzuto to go. While she leaves, she promises that she will eventually tell Iris about the Hound of the Baskervilles. And with that, Naruhoto, Holmes, and Iris are all left on the dock. Holmes then decides to tell you that in order for them to get there, they had to use the emergency train, resulting in Holmes being sued. And he then told them that was all on you. And to that, Naruhoto says, And that is the entirety of Dai Gyakuten Saiban, one of the three spin-off ace tourney games that never properly left Japan. This game is truly something special to me. While it may not be the best game in the series to most of the fanbase, it is my personal favorite. It definitely had its faults. The first case dragged completely and there were many plot contrivances that I wish didn't exist. I wish that the first two cases related much more to cases 3 and 5. While I concur that Ace Attorney Investigations 2 had a much stronger narrative in cases, I think that the strengths of Dai Gyakuten and Saiban should also be recognized. The team had attempted to make the first case into a fully-fledged murder trial instead of giving a brief introduction to the mechanics like the rest of the games do. The soundtrack is the best in the series, by far. The orchestral music was incredibly unique and served to add dramatic flair and tension to the game while adding realism to the time period of the game. The graphics are gorgeous as new animations and camera work during trials and investigations were introduced as a series first. The way the trials and investigations are broken up without getting stale thanks to new gameplay mechanics is genius. The theatrical sequences in which you and Holmes get to bounce theories off each other is hilarious and dramatic, all while making you feel like the smartest person in the room. The closing argument is a welcome addition that makes you think differently about the case, forcing you to challenge your own conventions and determine the truth of murder. The cases themselves are nothing to sneeze at, with politics and conspiracy theories centering around it all with a scope much bigger and grander than that of any other Ace Attorney games. But at the heart of it, what really makes this game stand out is its characters. Look, I love Phoenix, Apollo, Trucy, Athena, and everyone else we met over the mainline games, but what DGS was able to do was make me feel much more invested in these characters and truly get invested in the story because of it. I watched the anxious English student Narahoro hiding behind the shadow of Asogi transform over the course of the game into the strong-willed barrister with newfound resolve and confidence. I met Asogi, the stalwart hero who never wavered and taught Narahoro how to live. I met Suzuto, the feminine yet surprisingly strong assistant who was always there for me. I met Sherlock Holmes and was able to see why he was considered the great detective despite all of his shortcomings. I met Iris Watson, the adorable wonderkind who knows exactly what to say yet never loses that childlike wonder. And each of us has undergone our own separate changes over the course of our journey, learning what it truly means to believe. After all, you can't believe in anyone else if you don't believe in yourself. By the end, I felt this strong sense of camaraderie between all of us, despite knowing these characters for only a sixth of the time compared to the cast of the main series. It was a real journey that we had undergone through as the narrative flowed smoothly from case to case. As we progressed, we discovered plot twist after plot twist, discovering how deep the rabbit hole goes. Everything was connected as the characters learned more about the seedy underbelly of London and how it truly feels alive. Compared to the mainline series where cases tend to feel disjointed or that they could have been played in any order, I was much happier to have this cohesive narrative. The entire game felt extremely refreshing due to the new scenery and characters. Cooperating with Holmes to find the truth was some of the most fun I've had in a while playing a video game as it tickled my brain in the best way possible. But most importantly, it knew when to exit the stage. It had a story it wanted to tell, nothing more and nothing less and it accomplished that with aplomb. It was clearly not meant to be milked for the future like the mainline Ace Attorney games ended up being. It had a vision. It had a message. And it knew what it wanted to be. That's something not a lot of other games can say. After playing Ace Attorney Investigations 2, what did you take away from it? Personally, I had a good time and was flabbergasted by the murders, but nothing more. Outside of the actual cases, Investigations 2 didn't really give me anything. 
However, while the Great Ace Attorney may be weaker overall in terms of cases, it gave me that sense of cohesion and truly attached me to the characters. And even though the game is over, there are still many unanswered questions. Too many count, and too many secrets I would dare not spoil. But none of them feel like sequel bait. The game manages to tell a narrative that suffices on its own while at the same time offering potential for the future. The Great Ace Attorney is a true gem and deserves to be acknowledged by the rest of the world. While it may not be a perfect game, it certainly is the best 3DS game that you couldn't play. I want to give my thanks to all the translators at Scarlet Stay for doing such passionate work on this translation, and for lending me an ear for an interview despite the tumultuous times. I encountered very few issues that took me out of the game, and this seriously rivals professional localization. Please, go to the description and download the translation for yourself, as well as purchase a copy of the game. I want to thank the few people behind the scenes that encouraged me while I worked on this project. It was certainly a long time coming, and I didn't nearly expect this video to be as long as it was. I want to thank Shu Takumi, Kazuya Nuri, Shinitoro Kojima, and all the development staff at Capcom for making such a wonderful game. If the leaked Switch port of DGS is ever released in the West, and is more than just a game pitch, then I'll be sure to play it as well. And most of all, I would like to thank you, the viewer. You had no reason to watch this two hour long video on a game that you most likely never played, much less cared about. But you did anyway. This was my passion project that has been in the works for months, and I couldn't be happier with how it turned out. Since this is my first large-scale review, I guarantee that one day I'll look back and wish I had done things differently. But now, all I feel is gratitude and happiness, so thank you. Subscribe to see what I'll come up with next, and I'll see you soon. Have a great day.